Chapter 5 The little helicopter chugged off toward the northwest. As it flew across the deserted landscape, it seemed as if its lonely survivors were like Noah in his ark. About 60 miles north of Pittsburgh, their view was assaulted by the sprawling tentacles of an enormous structure. Half a dozen roads converged on a parking lot the size of six football fields, veined with yellow lines and arrows. It was a huge shopping mall. Shopper's paradise, the sign said. Created out of the mountainous terrain of the coal mining territory. It had been designed to bring a more suburban influence into the area. Fortress-like, the outer walls were all concrete, and they stretched upward from more than two stories. Entrance to the structure was through four doorways, situated north, south, east, and west. Inside was a self-sufficient environment of shops that catered to all the needs of the community. Food, clothing, shelter, and leisure. A sophisticated system of air ducts and heating apparatus precluded the need for outside windows and focused the shopper's attention on the flashy consumer products inside. As the helicopter drew closer, the passengers noted that what few cars remained in the lot were parked haphazardly, some with their doors wide open. The little machine eased itself down onto the roof of the building. The engine sputtered and coughed, and the blade slowed down, so that their whirring noise was now only a buzz. Fran, who was now very uncomfortable, with an uneasy feeling in her stomach and a pounding headache from lack of food and sleep, looked around in horror. In the parking lot, walking among the abandoned vehicles, almost like shoppers on a typical Saturday, were hordes of the living dead. If she hadn't known better, she would have mistaken them for normal people. But their lumbering walk was unfortunately extremely recognizable. At the North Mall entrance, the all-glass revolving door flanked by two ground-to-ceiling picture windows and several regularly hinged doors was surrounded by a number of zombies. A few of them had managed to negotiate the hinged doors and enter the building. Others bounced off windows and clawed at the transparent glass in confusion. One creature was trapped in the revolving door and circled endlessly. The creatures, as was their nature, wandered around aimlessly with no apparent purpose. Even the whirring sound of the helicopter caused them no alarm. Oh my God, Fran cried in terror as she watched the loathsome parade from the ledge of the roof. Stephen ran over to her side. He stared at the creatures moving steadily toward the building. No chance, he declared, starting back toward the copter. Forget it. Let's get out of here. Roger walked out to the couple and took a glance around the parking lot. Wait a minute, wait a minute. They can't get up here. Yeah, Steve said, a frantic note in his voice. And we can't go down there. Let's check it out, Roger said calmly, but with authority. He turned and noticed that Peter had already done so. He was the type who didn't wait for a consensus of opinion, but made an affirmative move. Roger trotted over to him. Most of the gates are down, Peter said, staring through one of the giant grids of transparent plexiglass bubbles that faced down into the building. Roger peered through another of the bubbles. I don't think they can get into the stores, Peter told him. From their vantage point, the two troopers were only able to see a small segment of the interior. It was a square plaza with a garden beneath the sunroof of transparent bubbles. The space was open all the way down to the garden, that was only two stories below. Pathways to the entrances of the shops generated from the garden like spokes from the hub of a wheel. All but one of the heavy metal cage gates that protected the stores were down and locked into position. Roger could see only three or four zombies tottering about. They bounced off the locked gates and would probably wander into the unlocked one eventually. Peering around the bubble, Roger could see that halfway up the wall, a balcony railing surrounded the entire place. There was a second level of stores with the same cage-like gate sealing off the entrances. As far as Roger could tell, none of the ghouls had made it up to the balcony. Yet. Fran and Stephen noticed the two troopers' fascination with the bubbles and jogged over to see what all the interest was about. I haven't seen any of them up on the second floor, Roger told Peter. 
The big department stores usually use both floors. You probably have to take an escalator up to those floors from inside the store. If we can get in up top, Roger replied. But Peter was already off, looking across the rest of the expansive rooftop. Suddenly, he ran toward a series of other housings that jutted up out of the otherwise flat surface. Curious, Roger followed. Fran was still mesmerized by the scene below the plastic bubble. What are they doing here? She asked Steve. Why do they come here? Some kind of instinct, Steve answered. The profundity of his next statement was almost a parody. Memory of what they used to do. This was an important place in their lives. With morbid fascination, they watched the zombies who wandered aimlessly over the plaza. Some tried the gates but could not budge them. One, a woman, wandered out of the single open shop and appliance store. As the female creature left, she dragged a toaster idly behind her, pulling it by its power cable as it scraped loudly on the floor. Peter and Roger reached an installation of large reflectors mounted in an intricate metal skeleton that stretched across a large area of the roof surface. Behind the structures, a large power generator could be seen. Solar screens, Peter said quietly. A scheme seemed to be forming in his mind. Can't be enough to power this place, Roger stated. Emergency system, maybe. It's pretty lit up in there, Roger recalled. Guess the power's not off in this area, Peter said to Roger's back as the big white man trotted off to another protruding structure on the rooftop. A lot of Philly still lit. Peter continued to know one in particular. Could be nuclear. But Roger wasn't listening. He had found something very exciting. Hey, look at this, he called to his three companions. He was peering down through a wire-hatched skylight. There were several of these skylights laid out over this particular area of the roof. He moved to another one, almost as if he were a voyeur in a porno house looking through the peepholes. Peter moved to the first. Fran and Steve ran over to see what this excitement was about. These don't go down into the mall, Roger exclaimed. The hell is this? Fran and Steve peered down to the darkness, wondering what the attraction was that this roof had for the two men. All Fran and Steve wanted was to get back on the helicopter and fly off in the opposite direction to this place. It gave them the creeps. Any moment now, they expected the zombies to charge up the roof and attack them. Each moment they lingered was precious. They wanted to exploit as many hours of daylight as they could and possibly make it to Canada, where they hoped the situation was different or at least improved. Peter, in his steadfast, fastidious manner, pulled a flashlight from his utility belt. He had stayed in full uniform all the while. Roger, in the meantime, had stripped off all the police paraphernalia except for his ammunition belt and pistol holster. Peter shone his light beam down to the space. The floor appeared to be only about seven feet below the window. Damn, Peter admitted, as he saw that there was absolutely nothing in sight. Clear light gray floor, clear light gray walls. Hey, over here, Roger called out as he moved to another window. There's something here. Peter ran over and shone his beam down again. They could see a vast array of cardboard cartons, hundreds of them. Storage, Roger asked. Civil defense, Peter surmised as he moved the light beam. It illuminated a collection of large drums stacked floor to ceiling and running deep past the line of vision. On the face of each drum was the familiar symbol of a triangle within a circle and the letters CD. And boxes of canned food! Roger cried out happily like a kid finding a toy. How do we get down there? said Stephen. He just wanted to get off the rooftop, either back into the copter or inside the building. He felt vulnerable and exposed on the open rooftop. For the first time since they'd disembarked from the helicopter, Peter acknowledged Steve's presence. With a sneer on his face, he destroyed Steve with one glance. 
Then he brought his rifle butt down against the glass and stared directly into Steve's eyes as the shattered pane crashed to the floor below. They all peered with awe into the vast space. In places, the darkness was interrupted by shafts of sunlight that drifted in from the various skylights. The barren space was very quiet. Peter shouldered his rifle, replaced his flashlight, and dropped feet first into the room. He stood for a moment, silhouetted in a sunray, waiting, watching as if he were a hunting dog scenting the prey. Then he readied his rifle, looking this way and that across the large room. Okay, he called quietly, and Roger dropped cat-like to the floor. The two men instantly slung their rifles and moved to the food cartons. They had prearranged that they would carry the big boxes to the spot directly under the open skylight to facilitate Steve and Fran's entrance into the semi-darkened room. In a few moments, moving quickly and without speaking, they had constructed a pyramid out of the cartons. It seemed as if they had designed a kind of stairway to heaven, except that this stairway could only lead to a greater hell, with the monotonously circling zombies waiting below. The creatures had nothing but time on their side. Fran was shaking as she watched the two troopers piling box upon box. Unsure of herself, she clutched Stephen's arm as he helped her get her footing on the cartons. Then she reached for Roger's outstretched hand, and he guided her down the rest of the way. An anxious Steve followed, but whether his anxiety was for Fran or himself, it was hard to tell. Peter had not waited for the two civilians to enter. He was already off, as if on some dangerous mission in an exotic faraway land. He had no patience for the two neophytes. He had already written Steve off as a weakling, who, although he could pilot the helicopter, was of no use on the ground. And Fran, while she was certainly spunky, was a woman, and according to Peter, subject to over-emotionalism. In the enormous room, Peter noted only two doors, one at either end. The big trooper moved up to one of them as Roger came up behind him. Roger's gun was readied. Peter turned the doorknob. A click told him that it was unlocked, and he gave Roger a familiar nod. Roger stood several feet back, his rifle aimed directly at the door and ready to fire. Then, with a sudden commando-like motion, Peter threw the door open and ducked away flat against the wall. Roger stiffened, his finger all but pulling his rifle trigger. But there was no apparent danger. Roger shivered slightly and took in a sharp breath. He hadn't realized that he had been holding his breath the whole time Peter was turning the doorknob. The blonde trooper was determined not to let the other man see his fear. Roger realized that in order to gain Peter's respect... He had to be as cold-hearted and precise as the big trooper. And even at a time like this, respect was very important to Roger. It was quite obvious to Roger that Peter had become impatient with Fran and Steve. And since they were Roger's friends, he felt that he had to become even fiercer and more courageous to make up for his friend's lack. It was so ingrained in him that he had to please the authority figure that even while his very life was in danger, he could only think about gaining Peter's approval and acceptance. The door opened into another vast room that seemed to be about the same dimensions as the first room and also contained stacks of CD supplies. The troopers moved cautiously through the door into the area. The room was also empty, and the sun's rays pierced through the darkness from the skylights in this room as well. The room was dead quiet, and there was a door at the other end of it. Double damn, Roger cried out. Looks like a free lunch, buddy. In the first room, Stephen had started to open one of the cartons. Spam, Fran said with disgust. You bring a can opener? Roger asked as he walked back into the room. Oh, Fran looked disheartened. Then don't knock Spam. Roger explained lightly. It's got its own key. Fran flipped the can over in her hand and found the little key. Meanwhile, Peter had walked right past the group as if they didn't exist. He had a fierce, concentrated look in his face as though he was alone on a terrible mission. 
He walked with such a single-minded purpose that Fran mused that he had lapsed into a trance. Peter strode toward the still unknown door at the other end of the room. Roger, giving Fran a quick shrug of the shoulders as if he could read her mind, followed obediently. At the door, the two troopers went through the same stylized SWAT tactics they'd used at the first door. The door swung open into a very small space. Again, to Roger's relief, there was no immediate danger. As they entered, the men realized that they were on the top landing of a concrete and metal fire stair. Roger recalled his meeting with Peter that had taken place in a similar location. Although it was now only 24 hours later, it seemed a lifetime. The space was stifling, no windows, musty, stale air. A lone bare light bulb dangled from the ceiling, but down the stair at the next landing, it was quite dark, and further down the stairs, the blackness was so thick that Roger felt as if he had been swallowed by a great monster. What do you think? He asked Peter trepidatiously. The black man just stared into the darkness and then back into the storage area. This is the only way up here, Roger continued, his voice bouncing off the concrete walls, echoing in his ears. What do you think? The black man merely continued staring at the empty space. Then, as if he were alone, he turned and entered the main room, where Stephen Fran waited on pins and needles. Roger stood for a moment on the landing and then followed Peter into the main room. He couldn't figure him out, but at least he could rely on him for making the right decision. Roger walked into the center of the room. As soon as he cleared the door, Peter appeared and slammed the stairway door closed, turning the flimsy lock. Then, without speaking to the other three, who stood by mutely waiting for orders, Peter started stacking the cartons against the door a barricade against the unknown. The group of refugees sat on the floor near the pyramid under the open skylight. They had attacked their cans of spam with relish, and the empty tins littered the area. Stephen slept fitfully, his head in Fran's lap. Her hand was in his hair, and occasionally she patted him as one would a feverish child. This was the first real sleep he was able to have since they'd left Philadelphia. Roger leaned against the pyramid watching Peter, who sat in the lotus position, his gun across his legs. For the past hour, Peter had not taken his eyes off the doorway to the suspicious stairwell. Infrequently, he and Roger still picked at the cans. Roger swilled water from an empty can that he had filled from one of the CD drums. You'd better get some sleep too, buddy, Roger cautioned, nodding toward Stephen. There's an awful lot of stuff down there. But we could use, brother, Peter said softly, allowing Roger into his thoughts for the first time that day. I know it. Fran's deceptive tranquility at having her stomach filled and being out of immediate danger was shattered by the men's talk. Instantly, she realized that this wasn't a rest and recovery stop, but a mercenary raid. They're pretty spread out down there, Peter continued. It's a big place. I think we could outrun them. Hit and run, Roger agreed, unaware that Fran was now listening and getting increasingly angered. Hit and run? Maybe grab us off a radio. Fran could stand it no longer. What was happening to them? Didn't they realize they would be no better than common criminals? You're crazy, she blurted out. She extricated herself from the sleeping Steve and walked over to the two troopers. This place could be a gold mine, Roger said, checking his weaponry and moving quickly toward the door where he began to remove the carton barricade. We gotta at least check it out. This is exactly what we're trying to get away from, Fran said to the still-seated Peter, who was checking his own guns. Look what happened at the airport. The only problem at the airport was stray bullets, Peter told her belligerently. We could outfight those dummies blindfolded. Fran ran over to Stephen and shook him, but the exhausted pilot was dead to the world. Leave him be, Peter said, standing to his full height. We're going ourselves. He bent over and snatched up Steve's rifle. He snapped off the safety and slammed a shell into the chamber and handed it to the woman. 
that's ready to shoot. He said in a surprisingly gentle tone of voice, be careful. Fran held the gun as if it were about to explode. The trigger squeeze is real easy, but the weapon will kick you good when it fires, Peter explained. Be ready for that. Wait a minute, I... Anyone but us comes up them stairs. You guys take off in the machine. We'll try to make it out to the parking lot. You can pick us up there. Fran was speechless. She just stared at the black man in total fright with desperation in her eyes. She knew that the troopers had made up their minds and that her arguments would be useless. If we don't show up after a few minutes, we'll catch up to you some other time. You understand? His voice was toneless, and Fran sensed a greater meaning behind the words. She felt frozen to the spot and could only shake her head up and down like a little girl. Roger and Peter, their faces set in stone, proceeded toward the fire stair. They pulled open the door on the top landing and were greeted by the same dimly lit corridor as before. They moved slowly out onto the landing and looked into the darkness below. Then, without looking back at the trembling figure of Fran poised at the doorway, clutching her rifle, they moved slowly and silently down the steps. Suddenly, Peter stopped and turned back to Fran as if he'd forgotten to tell her something. You'll probably hear some shooting, he said to the frightened woman. Just don't panic, okay? Fran could barely manage a sigh in return. You'll be all right. It's our asses that's in the fire. Fran stood in the landing until she could no longer see the men. She could still hear their footsteps padding down the narrow metal stairs. Slowly she turned around, the gun clutched in her arms as if it were her child. She shut the door behind her and locked it. Then she struggled with a few of the heavier boxes and barricaded the door once again. She glanced at Stephen. How was he able to sleep throughout all this was beyond her. She just hoped that the two troopers would be back soon, and that they all could get out of here for good. By now, the two big men were two landings below the barricaded door. There was almost no light now from the single bulb two landings above. Roger clicked on his flashlight and shone the beam around. He saw that he was in a very small concrete space. The stairs went down no further, and there was only one door. Peter eased down the steps behind him. This is the only way up there, Roger told him when they were at the same level. They opened the door slowly and discovered that they were in another cement-walled space that also seemed small but was fully lit. They stepped cautiously into the room and found themselves at the end of a very long, narrow hallway. Directly across from them were two open supply rooms. The rooms had the scent of cleaning solutions and ammonia. Buckets with huge ringers and stringy mops were lined up against a stationary sink and toilet. Their eyes followed the one wall of the hallway, and they could see a dozen or so doorways, some open, some closed. Along the opposite wall, however, there was nothing. The far end of the hall, about a hundred yards away, opened out onto the second story of the mall proper. The two men looked at each other, feeling like intruders in so mundane a situation, the maze-like hallway of an office. They walked down the corridor, trying the first two doors that were locked, and finally getting lucky with the third that was wide open. Roger ducked into the room with his rifle raised. It was a large administration office with rows of desks that were fully equipped for a staff of secretaries and accountants. Papers were scattered all over and chairs overturned as if people had left in a hurry. Peter continued to the next door that was closed but unlocked. He swung open the door and silently jumped into a room that was much more spartan, with two metal desks and a few chairs. Several phones were arranged on a plain metal table. The green-gray furniture and lack of any discriminating features except for a few pinup pictures and a girly calendar suggested a maintenance office. On one wall was a large map of the mall with pin flags and scribbling over an acetate that covered the drawing. At the other end of the room was a huge electrical panel with circuit breakers and an entire series of master controls, all keyed to a number code to another map of the mall showing electrical installations. On the wall behind Peter was a large blackboard and two metal cabinets. 
The open one contained all sorts of tools, both manual and electric. There were circuit testers, walkie-talkie units, and several enormous rings containing hundreds of keys that were also colored and number-coded. The keys to the kingdom, Roger said in awe as he stepped behind Peter, who had grabbed one of the rings. They scurried back into the hallway, two kids anxious to try a new toy. Roger picked up the keys and tried several on the doorknob of what looked like the corner office. The door opened onto a beautifully plush hallway, carpeted in deep rust pile with mahogany paneling leading to the executive suites, obviously the headquarters of the gigantic mall. The labyrinth of interconnecting offices were all decorated in chrome and leather and highly polished wood. Peter and Roger wandered in and out, finding themselves in the secretary's anterooms and then ending up in connecting conference rooms. They would each take a different path and end up meeting each other again. The offices were all designer decorated with huge paintings and sculptures and massive picture windows looking out to the woods beyond the parking lot. The troopers finally reached a room that was not approachable through either the locked interior or corridor doors. The brass nameplate bore the inscription, C.J. Porter, President. Roger moved to the corridor where he joined Peter. They were very near the end of the hall, and the brightly lit shopping area was visible, although they could only make out a small section. They realized they were in the seat of power, but they didn't realize how much power. Porter was the president of Amalgamated Industries, and the shopping malls were only a tiny part of their clothing firms, fabric mills, and department stores that were spread across the nation. That he had chosen this gigantic, out-of-the-way mall for his headquarters was only one example of the eccentricity of the brilliant, powerful billionaire. The balcony on that Peter and Roger stood was railed off against the open drop to the first floor. Across the vast atrium below, they could see the opposite balcony. On the far side, only two storefronts could be seen, and both were closed off by gates. Just as if they were about to embark across a minefield in Southeast Asia, the two troopers realized the danger inherent in their actions. They looked at each other steadily and then moved forward, each clinging to the opposite walls in the corridor. As they reached the mall proper, they slowly and carefully peered around the respective corners. From their viewpoint, they could see that the upper balcony totally surrounded the vast interior of the building. At several points, bridges spanned from one side to the other. Almost as if they were in a marketplace, little shops of all types ran along the entire length of the balcony. At each end, there was a spectacular arched entrance to a large department store, gates to the temples of plenty. Both stores, Porter's and Stacy's, were part, of course, of Amalgamated's empire. Most of the stores were gated, but a few seemed open. The gates of Porter's, however, were barred and locked. Here and there, tall trees reached up toward the skylights in the second-story ceiling, desperately searching for the natural light. The living dead were conspicuous by their absence. None of them appeared in the upper balcony, although the men could sense their diabolical presence. The troopers moved slowly and quietly to the railing and then crouched to peer down through the bars of the rail. Below, the sight was even more spectacular. It was a wonderland of consumers' delights. Stores of every type offered gaudy displays of items. There were clothing, appliances, photography equipment, audio and video outlets, even a sporting goods store with weapons in the window. Besides a modern supermarket, there were gourmet shops and natural organic food stores. A bookstore, record store, real estate agency, bank, novelty shop, and gift shop were next. Each was shiny and new-looking, begging the passing shopper to stop in and take a look. At each end, as in the upper concourse, like the main altars at the end of a cathedral, stood the mammoth two-story department stores, symbols of a consumer society. The layout of the mall reminded Peter of the time that he was in Mexico, except that all the shops were outside rather than inside. Down the center of the polished marble floor were little stalls. This was the trading place of the peasants of the consumer society. 
those who couldn't afford the walls, but who were just as anxious to peddle their wares. Situated among the gardens and park benches were a tobacco specialist, a jewelry stall with imitation gold necklaces, rings, and bracelets, a small photography portrait stall where in happier times mothers took their scrubbed and crying children for their first picture. There were also restaurants and snack bars to feed the exhausted, tired, and hungry shoppers and give them energy to buy more and more. There was an arcade with coin-operated machines selling everything from children's toys to blood pressure readings. Upon a large turntable designed to spin but now still, a late model car was on exhibit. Other turntable displays showed futuristic household appliances, many way out of the range of the typical shopper. But even though they were unable to purchase those time-saving devices, the people still liked to gawk and fantasize that one day they might be able to. To Roger and Peter, who weren't usually ponderous thinkers, the familiar images appeared as an archaeological discovery, symbolizing the gods and customs of a civilization now gone. But like any civilization, there were remnants, fossils that had been unearthed, and they trod lightly below in the aisles of the great cathedral. As the troopers, so removed now from any normal circumstances that their perspective had been distorted, moved toward their treasures, they were unaware that twenty pairs of vacantly staring eyes were watching them. Chapter 6 The two big men in their military regalia gazed out across the sprawling mall. It's Christmas time down there, buddy, Roger said with wonder. Fat city, brother. How are we going to work it? We get into the department stores up here, Roger plotted. They probably have their own escalators inside. Let's check those keys, Peter suggested. At this point, the two troopers had a narrow-minded objective. Get as many supplies as possible. Neither of them stopped to think about what would fit into the small helicopter that barely held its human passengers. They greedily headed toward the administration corridor and moved quickly down the hall toward the maintenance office. As they left the balcony, a zombie staggered out of one of the open stores several yards away from where they had been standing. It was followed by a second creature, a female without an arm. Steadily, menacingly, they moved along the balcony toward the open corridor. In the maintenance office, the troopers compared the keys against the coded map on the wall. 72 U and D, Roger called out as he poured over the map. Here it is. He and Peter checked the keys and Peter found the corresponding numbers. Here, he said, holding it out toward Roger. Let's hope it's right. Look here, Peter said, pointing to the map. These numbers must all be locks. Front, side, back, outside. Must be like loading docks. But what are these? He pointed to several numbered spots that seemed to be within the big Porter's department store that they were studying. Washroom? Roger guessed. Equipment? I don't know. While Peter still stared at the map, Roger moved off toward the electrical control panel. I guess these gotta be the gates, Peter surmised. Roger wandered around the room cheerfully. He noted something on the control panel with a smile and turned toward Peter. How about a little music? What? Peter asked, totally taken aback by the frivolity of the statement. The big trooper moved up behind his blonde partner. One of the controls on the panel was marked music tape. The master switch was in the off position. Another switch was marked floor exhibits, and a series of others were marked escalators. There were dozens of master switches that were all in the off mode. Power switches, Peter said to himself. The music might cover the noise we make, Roger said practically. Hit them all, Peter said magnanimously. Might as well have power in everything. We might need it. With a gleam in his eye, Roger hit all the switches one at a time. Throughout the mall, the dull, droning sound of Muzak poured out through the loudspeakers. Upstairs, the curious sound reached a startled Fran. 
She snapped the rifle into her hands, ready to fire, but she couldn't stop her hands from shaking. She had been standing, one ear cocked to the strange music below, just inside the storage area. Now she stepped into the fire stair and tried to see through the darkness. The sounds of the insipid music drifted up toward her. Stephen, she cried, leaning into the storage area again. Stephen! His mind still fuzzy from his long-needed rest, Steve roused himself. At first he thought he'd been dreaming about the music. That sounded unbelievably like what he used to hear in his dentist's office and the frantic call of Franz. He opened his eyes, and for a moment, he couldn't place the big, cold room filled with cartons. Then he remembered and jumped up to find Fran. He found her just inside the storage area, her eyes straining in the darkness, the rifle held to her breast. She looked so tiny in comparison to the big rifle, and she was shuddering with fear. Steve led her into the larger room and closed the door. Where the hell are those guys? He asked still half asleep and rubbing his eyes. What the hell is going on around here? Fran had calmed down sufficiently to try to explain what had transpired while Steve was asleep. You mean they're actually going to raid the department store? What do they expect to do with stuff from there? That's just it, she told him, a look of fear in her eyes. It's as if they've lost all perspective. We just wanted to stop here for some food and rest, or so that's what I thought. But they act like they're on some kind of secret mission. I swear they're acting like a bunch of kids playing cops and robbers. Steve reached over and pulled Fran close to him. Don't worry. He told her in a voice that he hoped sounded calm. They're not that crazy. Then what are we going to do? They said if they didn't come back to leave without them. How long should we wait? She collapsed in a heap, crying and shaking at the same time. All Steve could do was hold her to him tightly. He knew that if he tried to explain anything, he would break down as well. Meanwhile, on the first floor of the mall, it looked as if a giant hand had turned on its own special mechanical toy. Only it wasn't a toy. It was an entire shopping center. The automobile turntable started spinning. The great escalators began to move up and down. Two of the living dead, caught just starting up a stalled escalator, fell and rolled down as the mechanical steps began to move. As if it were a carnival come alive, lights blinked on on the exhibits. Mechanical window displays began their robot-like motions. The zombies, bothered by the Muzak, wandered about the floor in increased confusion. Some of them swatted ineffectually at the moving exhibits. Disturbed by the movement, the tropical birds housed in the floor-to-ceiling cages woke up, chirping and squawking for their feed. In a pet shop, puppies and kittens in a window display whined and scrambled over one another in fright at the noise, the motion, and the tottering creatures. All that was missing was the real-life action of human shoppers. On one of the floor exhibits, a rear projection movie started. A narrator spoke in a friendly voice. And for a price that anyone can afford, you can live in these luxurious new homes by Brandon. Fully electric, central air. The newly distracted zombies started strutting around at a quicker pace, bumping into each other in the moving displays. Some tried to return the way they'd come in, but they only bounced off the glass door. The one who had been circling endlessly had fallen to the ground, and his head was wedged between the ground and the door, preventing anyone else from entering or leaving. In the maintenance office, the troopers readied themselves for their raid. Peter secured the vital key ring to his utility belt, and they moved out. Roger's mind was a million miles away as he moved through the doorway and into the corridor. He was still lightheaded from the thought of all those wonderful goodies waiting for him downstairs. He was totally unprepared for his head-on meeting with one of the zombies from the balcony. Startled, he ducked back into the room. The zombie, blindly reaching out with clutching hands, rounded the corner and appeared in the doorway. With precision accuracy, Peter raised his gun and fired two shots cleanly through the creature's head. On the top of the fire stair, Fran jumped as the sound of the shots reverberated through the enormous mall. 
Jesus Christ, Steve screamed, grabbing the rifle from the petrified woman. They're maniacs. He looked long and hard at Fran. He was torn between staying here with her and charging downstairs to see what was going on. Fran needed protection, but he also needed to prove to her, to himself and to those two macho supermen downstairs, that he could join the battle. Fran saw the indecision in his eyes. Stephen, don't go down there, she pleaded. Stephen, please. It's all right, he said calmly, starting to make his way down the stairs. In the corridor of the administration offices below, Roger and Peter were stepping over the corpse. What do you think? Roger asked as the second zombie, the armless female, came into his view. He fired his weapon and the creature fell in a heap. As if nothing had happened, he continued his conversation. Bag it or try for it? He asked his comrade. You game? Peter asked. Roger nodded, and the two men ran down the hall toward the mall. With their rifles poised, they seemed like commandos on an important raid. All that was missing was the blare of the trumpets as Roger and Peter charged into battle. The enemy wandered around the first floor, attracted by the sound but confused by the sudden intrusion of the noise into their quiet domain. In misguided, staggering strides, they walked this way and that, glazed, vacant eyes passing by the stores and shops with their glittering array of goodies. Several of the zombies walked toward the escalators that in their dormant state had been easy to negotiate. But now, the moving escalators tossed the zombies this way and that. Some of them tried going up the down escalators, while those few creatures who moved onto the up escalator fell against each other from the movement. They seemed like tumbling pins in a bowling alley. One of the zombies that fell on the escalator was carried upward despite its awkward position. Another managed to keep its balance by holding onto the handrail. And unbeknownst to Roger and Peter, several creatures had begun to move up the steps of a stationary stairway that ran from the first to the second floor and was located at the other end of the mall from the administration offices. Meanwhile, a sweating, nervous Steve was cautiously making his way down the steps of the fire stair. His rifle ready, his palms dripping, he tried to control his jittery nerves. Fran looked anxiously from the top landing. Several hundred yards away, Roger and Peter were barreling toward the huge gate that locked off the entrance to Porter's. The two troopers came to a crashing halt. Four or five zombies were staggering their way down a side concourse toward the troopers. They were about 300 feet away. Roger kept his rifle leveled off in the direction of the creatures while Peter tried the lock at the middle of the big roll gate. Beads of perspiration formed on his forehead as he fumbled with the keys and finally found the proper one. When it sank with a click into the receptacle that was right at the floor and the tumbler turned successfully, Peter sighed in relief. All right, he yelled to his friend. Creeping toward them, however, was the creature that had fallen on the escalator. His ghoulish companion, the one who was able to ride the whole way without falling, was also approaching the two unsuspecting troopers. Suddenly, to Roger's surprise, the head of the standing zombie became visible from Roger's perspective. He raised his gun and aimed for the creature's forehead. Peter tried to lift the roll gate, but it wouldn't move. It was still locked. You bastard! Peter screamed in frustration. What? Roger asked, his attention focused on the approaching ghouls. Still locked. On the side, Peter said, pointing to another assembly. He moved to the far side of the gate. The same key fitted, and Peter repeated the process. But Roger could not share his joy. His attention was on the creature riding the escalator almost near the top. Just as Roger was about to shoot, something caught his eye. The fallen zombies that up until now could not be seen behind the escalator railway suddenly came tumbling out onto the balcony floor. A shaken Roger took fire, but his aim was inaccurate. The pressures were starting to build, and for one moment, he stopped to think about the idiocy of what he was doing. That was his downfall 
because it disturbed his concentration. His shot hit the standing zombie in the neck, tearing half the throat away. The creature was thrown off balance enough to lose its footing. It fell back down the escalator, but before it reached the bottom, it stopped rolling. The steps carried it back up toward the second floor again. It was still very much alive. Two more creatures on the balcony struggled to stand. Roger watched them and then looked back over his shoulder. To his horror, he saw that zombies from the side concourse were about 150 feet away. Working against time, Peter turned the key in the lock, but again the gate would not budge. It moved slightly, and Peter could see that it was free from the middle and far right mechanism, but that there was a third lock on the far left. He moved to it quickly. As if they possessed some kind of primitive antennae, the other creatures on the first floor began to take note of the action upstairs, and they too started to move. Zombies surrounded the troopers on all sides now. Those who had managed to climb the stationary stairwell were now beginning to reach the second floor, but they were far down the main balcony. In order to reach the entrance to porters, they would have to pass the administrative corridor. Roger steadied his nerves and collected his thoughts. In the back of his mind, he was wondering what the hell was taking Peter so damn long. He fired his rifle again, and one of the nearby zombies fell in a heap. His confidence restored, he looked around for more of the enemy to mow down. For God's sake, Stephen. Fran called down the stairway upon hearing Roger's shot. Let's get up on the roof, she cried out to him desperately. At the middle landing, Steve stared down into the darkness below. More gunfire could be heard from them all. He was stuck. Part of him wanted to run up to Fran and escape with her in the chopper. The other part wanted to go down and get into the action. It's all right, he said, trying to convince himself as well. Those things don't move fast enough to catch us. The last part of his sentence was practically drowned out by the staccato beat of the gunfire. With a loud rumble, the large gate finally freed itself from its bonds and rolled up. Peter ducked into the store even as the gate was still rising. The momentum of the heavy metal carried the lip out of Peter's grasp, and it rolled out of his reach. It jerked up into its fully open position and rolled back down slightly, but still Peter could not reach the lip. It was over ten feet to the ceiling. The bottom of the gate rested about three feet above Peter's outstretched fingertips. Panicking for the first time since the whole horrible situation evolved, Peter turned to see the zombies advancing. Roger had just dropped another with a clean shot through the head. Then he backed into the archway of Porter's entranceway. Desperately, Peter looked around for something to stand on in order to reach the elusive gate. Steadily, the zombies advanced toward the arch. Peter grabbed a small counter used to display shoes, but it was deceptively heavy, and he called out to Roger. Here! Come on! Unfortunately, Roger had to abandon his strategic post at the arch in order to help Peter drag over the little counter. They dragged it to a point just at the side of the open arch, and Peter instantly jumped up on top of it. At that instant, a zombie rounded the corner and grabbed at Peter's leg. Startled, Peter started to kick, and the awkward motion caused him to fall off the little counter. Gracefully, he landed on his feet, but he was out on the balcony beyond the arch. Quickly, Roger brought his rifle butt around against the creature's head, and the zombie fell backward, but it was still alive. A few other creatures were only a few feet from Peter, who was now unarmed as his gun sat on the small counter inside the store. Roger leveled off his rifle but couldn't fire since Peter was in his line of vision. Suddenly, Peter made a move, and like a football player, cut to the left and then to the right. Diving, he threw himself at one of the creatures, carrying it into the store. Roger, all the while, had been firing on the advancing zombies, dropping one and then another. Behind you, behind you! Peter cried to Roger as he jumped back on the counter. The creature trapped in the store had knocked over a cosmetics display and tubes of lipsticks, compact cylinders of eyeliner and mascara rolled around under its feet. Finally, the creature leaned against the glass case that displayed false eyelashes and plastic nails and was able to regain its footing. In an instant, Roger turned and fired. 
the creature fell. In that time, Peter was able to grab the lip of the roll gate, and he started to bring it down. During all the commotion, several creatures gathered in the archway. They stood there clutching at the air with claw-like hands. One stood in the middle of the path of the roll gate, blocking its downward progress. Roger took careful aim and fired point-blank into the forehead of the zombie who was blocking the gate. It flew backward, crashing into a few of its brothers. As the gate started to lower, the clutching hands of the other zombies seemed to reach out and try to strangle Roger for killing one of their own. Roger dropped his rifle and ran to the gate now to try and help pull it down. Peter, still holding onto the lip, jumped off the counter to get more leverage. The two troopers were now sweating profusely. Large areas of dark were spreading under the arms and on the back of their uniforms. They were struggling to move the gate steadily down. It was now only four feet from the floor, but the creatures, who seemed to feel no pain, were throwing themselves in the path of the descending gate, making it more difficult. One of them tried to crawl underneath, and its torso just got through as the gate slammed down against its chest. Its arms grabbed for Peter's legs, and its mouth gaped open. Its mutilated body prevented the gate from engaging in the floor mechanisms. Roger let go of the gate as Peter tried to hold it against the creatures outside. Both men were exhausted now and barely had enough strength to pull the gate down, let alone battle the zombies. But some inner resource, some extra dose of adrenaline coursed through their veins. Grabbing his rifle, Roger brought the butt straight down, crushing the pawing zombie's skull. The zombie went limp, and Roger tried to push it clear of the gate, but the pressure was too enormous. Let up a little! Let up a little! He gasped to Peter. Peter let up the pressure, and the gate rose a few inches. But as more and more zombies appeared outside, they too clutched at the roll gate. The openings in the grid were only big enough for their fingers. Their hands could not reach through. However, the force of their pushing in unison caused the gate to go higher and higher, higher than Peter intended it to go to clear the obstructing corpse. With his rifle butt, Roger managed to push the dead zombie clear, except for one of its arms. From outside, the creature's hand suddenly grabbed Roger's weapon. For a moment, the macabre thought passed through Roger's mind. It was like the tug-of-war game he used to play with his friends when he was younger. Only now, the stakes were life or death. Come on! Come on! Peter cried out. He was having a harder time holding the gate, and it inched upward out of his reach. Roger decided to let go of the gun barrel, and the creature flew back into the crowd, brandishing its prize. Roger grabbed for the gate to help Peter, and they tried again to close it. The arm! That arm's in the way! Peter told him. Roger squatted and managed to throw the dead zombie's arm, that was now only held onto the body with a thin strand of muscle, clear. With a slight shiver of revulsion at what he had just done, Roger grabbed the gate again. Now, with both of the men focusing their attention and strength on the gate, it moved down more steadily. At the last moment, another clutching arm jutted into the store, but when the gate hit it, it withdrew. Finally, and not a minute too soon, the gate clicked solidly into place. The two troopers stepped back from the gate and collapsed against another glass display case. This one held sunglasses, suntan lotion, and various vacation time necessities. The men gathered their strength and watched in horror as the creature still moaned and gurgled, slamming against the gate. Their fingers clutched futilely at the grid, but they were unable to budge it. Well, we're in. Now how the hell are we going to get back? Roger asked, scanning the department store. About ten or twelve zombies tried to get in. Several others made their way along the balcony. Roger also noted in disgust that six lay dead along the floor, their heads bleeding profusely from gunshot wounds or smashed skulls. Let's go shopping first, Peter said, 
calm, cool, and collected once again. Roger marveled at his cold-hearted approach. The two big troopers backed into the aisles of the store. The creatures outside still pushed and shoved at the gate. The one with Roger's rifle had the instincts to use it as a bludgeon, but it had no effect. A trembling Stephen opened the door to the administrative corridor. A stench filled his nostrils, and a feeling of claustrophobia enveloped him. Zombies littered the dark, narrow hallway. He could see to the open end of the hallway and noted that it was inactive. He let his eyes roam along slowly, observing the washrooms and the long row of doors that led into the various offices. The sound of his breathing echoed in the corridor, and he could hear the blood pulsating through his veins. He was primed, ready for any attack. He moved slowly into the corridor, letting the fire stair door close behind him. Fran, who had been staring at the beam of Steve's flashlight so hard that her eyes hurt, gave a gasp as she watched the beam narrow, flicker, and finally disappear. She heard the door click shut in the darkness. Stephen, Jesus God, she uttered in fright as she backed into the storage area. She moved quickly to the little pyramid of cartons that led up to the roof and sat in the bottom carton, biting her fingers. The silence was unbearable. Every sound, the creaking of the building, the wind outside, sounded as if it were amplified tenfold. Meanwhile, in Porter's, Roger was riding down the escalator. On his back was a backpack, already filled with goods. He could have been a regular shopper, except for his uniform and rifle. When he got off the moving stair on the ground floor, the recorded music tape ended. He was struck by the eerie quiet of his surroundings, while the tape machine rewound itself. He moved through the clothing department, browsing through the racks of the latest fashions. His eye was caught by a leather blazer. While he admired it, he backed into one of the store mannequins, and the dead, vacantly staring eyes startled him. He snatched up a lined windbreaker and tied it around his waist by its arms, and then he trotted off down another aisle, looking for Peter. He found the big trooper with a radio under his arm, involved in snatching up a small television. Hey man, we can't carry all this shit, Roger protested. Peter ignored him and turned a corner, where he dumped the articles into something that Roger couldn't see. As Roger trotted over, he saw that Peter had a big gardening cart already heaped with goods. Oh, Roger remarked sarcastically. We're gonna just wheel right by him, right? We're gonna try, brother, Peter said grimly. We ain't doing this for the exercise. We might as well try to get what we can. There's no way this is gonna happen, Roger said, confused. Even though he didn't understand the plan, he began to help Peter toss things into the cart. They raced down the hardware aisle, tossing in tools and other supplies, such as electrical cables, flashlights, and batteries. It was almost as if they were contestants on a game show, like Supermarket Sweep, where they had five minutes in a store to grab whatever they could. They tried to put things in that would help them if they were stranded in a primitive area. Their thoughts were to get as far away from this civilization gone berserk as possible. Stephen, on the other side of the structure, was busily examining maps and electrical equipment in the maintenance office. He rummaged through one of the desks. He wondered where Peter and Roger were now. He hadn't heard any gunfire for at least 15 minutes and considered the possibility that they had made a getaway. But where would they go by foot? He had the keys to the copter and they wouldn't get far without him. At least that made him feel useful and powerful. At the open end of the corridor that led out to the second-story balcony, zombies wandered past. They headed for the department store entrance, where many of the creatures still clawed at the roll gate. The zombies moved randomly. Some were already leaving the gate, as their prey was now out of sight within the store. They began to wander aimlessly. Three of the creatures turned into the administrative corridor and started toward the offices. Stephen had, meanwhile, found a large binder in a desk drawer. It contained all the plans for the mall, duplicating the charts on the walls and including many others. 
He smiled with pleasure at the thought that here was all the material that he needed. A complete maintenance manual revealing all the workings and the entire layout of the huge shopping mall. Minute by minute, Steve's composure and confidence were building. He didn't feel that sinking feeling in his stomach that he felt when he thought that all was lost. Maybe it would still be possible for him and Fran to start a new life, a family. There must be some area of the North American continent that was free from this terror. They would try for Canada, if only the two troopers weren't with them. With their extra weight, that was almost twice as much as his and Fran's. They were a drain on the fuel supply. But they were fighters and quick thinkers. On the other hand, Steve wouldn't have stopped here in the first place, and they might have arrived up north in safety if they hadn't been wasting their time ransacking a department store and playing soldier with a bunch of ghouls. He slammed the drawer shut in disgust. The elevator door slid open with a loud whoosh, and the two troopers were revealed in the car. They pushed their cart out into the second-story aisle of the big store. Their attention was drawn to the roll gate and the creatures that clotted it ineffectually. They rolled the overflowing cart up very close to the gate. When the zombies saw their human prey again on the balcony, their moaning and clutching began anew. The troopers left the cart and disappeared back among the aisles. They ran onto the interior escalator, bounding down faster than the moving steps. Then they ran across the first floor until they could see the lower level roll gate. Since there hadn't been much going on at the gate for a while, the creatures had moved away, and a few could be seen wandering the concourse. Let's go, brother. The old okie doke Peter said with animation. They moved up to the roll gate. Hey, ugly! Roger called out to a zombie who lumbered past. The creature turned slowly. Its expressionless face registered the sound of a movement, and then it lumbered for the gate with a moaning roar. The gaping, blood-dripping mouth and clutching hands dove for the gate that popped forward from its thrust. The action caused Roger to jump, even though there was no immediate danger of the gate giving in. Let's raise some hell. Hey, hey! Peter shouted. Over here! Roger called out. Let's go over here! The creature's antennae were up again, and the signals they'd received were coming from the department store entrance. As one, they lumbered along toward the gate. When they reached it, several pushed at the metal grids. The troopers backed away but stayed in sight of the creatures. Roger seemed jumpy. Just give it time, Peter said in a soothing tone. Give it time. Upstairs, the dozen or so zombies at the upper gate were attracted by the commotion on the first floor. They too began to move away from the gate and lumber along the balcony toward the stairways and escalators. Stephen opened another drawer in the maintenance office. Rummaging around through old tea bags, unsharpened pencils, ones with broken points, bits of string and rubber bands, old forms and pieces of clean rags, he found a loaded handgun that he stuffed into his belt. Then he moved to the large cabinets containing the walkie-talkies and the keys. In the corridor outside, stray zombies who were not attracted to the commotion generated by Peter and Roger wandered in and out of the executive offices as they drew near to the maintenance room. Steve picked up the maintenance manual and started to leave the office. He was planning to go upstairs and go over all the exits and entranceways with Fran and try to plot out some kind of plan. He didn't want to wait around all day until Roger and Peter stopped masquerading as commandos and took some decisive action. As he peered around the corner, he saw the first zombie approaching from the hall. The creature saw him as well and reacted by reaching out its arms. Steve estimated it was about 20 feet away. That was all he had to know. He ducked back into the office and slammed the door. His heart began pounding again and a convulsive trembling overtook him. Unbeknownst to him, a second creature was moving up behind the first, and a third entered the corridor from the accounting office. Steve noticed that the metal door locked only with a key. He fumbled for a moment with his rifle, then he dove for the key cabinet. Panicking, he realized that there were hundreds of keys on the rings. He looked at the wall map. Suddenly, the room spun before him, 
In his anxiety, he couldn't focus on either the maps or the hundreds of keys. How would he lock the door, he wondered in alarm. In the hallway, the first creature slammed against the door. It ran its hands blindly along the door, missing the doorknob entirely. Then, in frustration, it pounded on the door with its open hands. Behind the door, the pounding only increased Steve's panic. He stared at the map, trying to calm the dizziness so that he could focus on the maze of numbers. Meanwhile, the second creature had reached the door, and it too was clawing at it. The third approached slowly. Rattling among the keys, Steve's fingers were shaking so vigorously that he couldn't hold the key ring still in order to decipher the numbers. Outside, one of the creatures, through its random clutching, was able to take hold of the knob and pushed in and out, not yet turning it. Steve's eyes bulged with terror as he saw the moving knob. He threw himself against the door, still trying to read the numbers on the keys. The knob turned slowly, and there was pressure from the other side, even against Steve's weight. He managed to slam the door shut despite the creature's insistent pushing. Frustrated in his attempt to read the small numbers on the key ring, Steve threw it down and grabbed his gun. During Steve's battle with the zombies in the administrative wing, others were falling over one another as they tried to move down the up escalator. They scrambled to their feet and moved toward the department store entrance. In the concourse, many of the creatures were moving toward the gate, and already there were a dozen or so clinging and shoving at the metal grid. Okay, Peter reported. They're coming. Through the crowd, he could see several other creatures lurching down the stationary steps. He readied his walkie-talkie, puffing the antenna out full. Go on up, he told Roger. Stay out of sight, but let me know when it's clear enough. Roger, clutching his walkie-talkie, disappeared among the aisles. As if he were running across a minefield in Nam, he crouched, going deeper into the store. Peter tried to hold the attention of the creatures at the gate. Right here, babies, he taunted. This is where it's at, you dumbass suckers. You dumb, you are dumb. Panning, Roger reached the back elevator. And as the doors closed, he breathed a sigh of relief and pushed the button for the balcony level. The doors glided open, and he moved through the second floor aisles with the stealth of a panther. I think we can move the wagon, he said into his walkie-talkie to Peter. Clear, came the crackling reply. Not altogether, but they're spread out pretty good, enough to move the wagon. Just as Peter was about to reply, a few creatures slammed against the first floor gate, but it held securely. Peter stared at the ghouls for a moment as he lowered his talk unit. Slowly, a confused and upset look on his face, he backed away into the depth of the store. He was an odd sight. An armed and obviously well-worn soldier walking through aisles of the latest in cosmetics, accessories, and jewelry. Upstairs, Roger peered out from behind a counter and saw that the second floor gate was clear. On the balcony, he noted several creatures still wandered around aimlessly, but most of them had already moved down the steps and escalators. Peter was still visible to the zombies at the first floor entrance. He clipped his talk unit onto his belt and then ducked and disappeared among the aisles. He ran, crouching out of sight, until he rounded a far wall and came up into the elevator and entered the car. Breathing heavily and leaning against the sidewall for support, he pushed two and watched as the doors glided shut. He felt the gears engage and the car move upward. The doorknob to the maintenance room rotated again and the door pushed against Steve's weight. His feet slid on the linoleum floor, and this time he could not get the door closed. Biting his lips so that he drew blood, he made the sign of the cross and backed suddenly into the room, holding his rifle high. The door flew open with a great slam against the interior wall, and the three zombies advanced into the office. With a sense of calm that amazed even himself, Stephen took careful aim at the leader and fired. Just as the elevator doors opened on the balcony level, Peter heard the sound of Steve's shot. 
For a moment, he hesitated as if to get his bearings, and then he ran toward the entrance arch. Roger was at work at one of the side locks on the gate. The gunfire caused him also to stop as he was unlocking the mechanism. He looked at Peter questioningly, the hand with the key poised in the air. The zombies on the balcony heard the sound as well, and they walked around in confusion, attracted by the noise. What the hell is that? thundered Peter as he walked up behind Roger. Fuzz, maybe? Or maybe Flyboy, he said gruffly. Where's it coming from? Can't tell, Roger said quietly, returning to his work. He had forgotten about Steve and Fran after he'd left them, and now he felt as if he might have deserted them. They certainly weren't equipped to deal with this horror show, and he felt somewhat responsible for their being here. Come on, Peter said impatiently. Open up. Maybe we should see what's happening, Roger said, feeling guilty. Peter ignored his plaintive tone. Open up. I can get the wagon over. If it is Flyboy, let's get him on our side. Roger moved toward the second lock, confused by Peter's seemingly disjointed answer. Another shot was heard. Peter set his weapon on the floor. You just cover me good, you hear? He warned. Roger moved to the third and final lock as Peter stood and grabbed onto the handle of the cart. To Steve's extreme surprise, the body of a zombie fell to the floor dead. Its head had been shot clean through. Nearby lay the corpse of the first creature to break into the office, also a surprise to Steve, who was so petrified he was barely conscious of what he was doing. As the third staggered into the room, Steve was ready for him. He held the rifle out in front, and as the creature walked toward the gun, Steve held his hands on the trigger. But the creature was too quick for him. Before Steve knew it, the zombie had lunged suddenly, and its hands grabbed the gun barrel. Steve fired, but the blast tore through the creature's chest, not slowing him in the least. Steve struggled to raise the barrel, but the motion of the zombie made it impossible to aim accurately. The gun fired again, this time grazing the zombie's neck. The ghoul was covered with dripping blood and pus. Its appearance was so distasteful to Steve that he had a hard time looking at him so as to take proper aim. With a sudden burst of energy, the creature was able to wrench the gun free. Then, it started its slow, deliberate approach towards Steve. It had tossed the rifle across the room, where it slammed to the floor by one of the desks. The zombie backed Steve against the wall right next to the key cabinet. With his eyes glued to the zombie's face that seemed extremely animated, almost as if it really knew what was going on, Steve reached around on top of the key cabinet, trying to find some weapon. He almost wept with joy as he felt some tools in the cabinet and came up with a hammer. The zombie was about to reach him when he pulled the hammer out and upset the cabinet. The zombie fumbled with the cabinet at its feet, but it did not fall. With a sudden burst of energy, Steve raised the hammer in order to smash the creature's head, but he missed, and the zombie grabbed at his arm, trying to bite it with its gaping hole of a mouth. Steve was able to wrench free, and the force of his movement caused the two bodies to fall to the floor. Now the creature was clutching at the man's legs, its teeth bared like an animal's. Steve kicked desperately and managed to land a blow squarely in the creature's face. The zombie came on after him again, and from his crawling position, Steve was able to bring up the hammer against the creature's jaw. The creature fell back enough for Steve to crawl across the floor away from it, but the ghoul followed persistently. Steve reached the desk where he grabbed up his rifle. Rolling on the floor, he fired several shots into the creature. A gushing red hole appeared in its forehead and between the eyes. Finally, it rolled to the floor, writhing in agony, destroyed. With a rumble, the second floor gate rolled up and Peter ran out of the store with his cart full of merchandise. The action caught the attention of several of the creatures that were still wandering around the balcony. They turned slowly in the direction of the disturbance. Just as he rounded the corner, Peter almost collided with one creature. 
The momentum of the run across the floor almost caused the cart to fall over. Luckily, Peter managed to ride it and get past, running as fast as he could toward the opening of the administrative corridor. Roger did not let the gate roll up too high this time. He stabilized the metal grid well within reach. Then he stood his post with Peter's rifle. Several creatures approached from the opposite direction. Roger fired at the closest one. It fell with a thud. He raised the rifle to fire at the others, but they were too far away for him to be accurate, and he didn't want to waste any bullets. Even with all the supplies they had garnered, he knew that all the bullets would be needed sooner or later. Concurrently, Stephen stepped over the corpses in the office and grabbed up the maintenance manual again. He rushed into the corridor, hoping that he wouldn't meet any more unwelcome guests. To his utter dismay, three more creatures moved toward him up the hallway. At first he froze, then he started backing toward the fire stair, his rifle poised. Peter was charging along with the supplies shaking on top of the cart like jelly. Just as he was about to reach the mouth of the corridor, a zombie stepped out of the hallway right in his path. Peter slammed the cart squarely into the creature's legs. The zombie fell into the cart on top of the supplies. The big man slammed the load against the wall at the mouth of the corridor. Before the zombie was able to get its balance, the big trooper reached down and grabbed the creature by its jacket lapels. It was almost comical. A big bouncer ejecting the unruly patron from a bar. With all his might, Peter flung the dead thing out against the balcony railing. The creature flipped over the rail at its waist, but did not fall off the balcony. Its arms and legs were flailing as Peter came up quickly behind it and flipped it over the rail. It plummeted to the ground silently and made a loud thud when it landed. At the second level store entrance, Roger fired again at a zombie that was drawing dangerously near. Other creatures throughout the area were again attracted to the entrance and converged as if it were a giveaway being conducted during the normal working hours. As Peter wheeled the cart into the mouth of the corridor, he saw Steve at the other end of the hall being boxed in by the three converging zombies. Hold it, flyboy! he screamed. Steve froze at the sound that seemed familiar. He could barely see Peter, since his line of vision was blocked by the advancing ghouls, who were barely thirty feet away from him now and steadily closing in. Don't go on the stairway, Peter instructed, a note of panic in his voice. Stephen was confused. The creatures were advancing, and Peter was giving him conflicting advice. Don't open that door, baby. You'll lead them right up with you. Steve was on the verge of panic. The zombies were merely ten feet away. He was trapped. Run for it, came Peter's strident command. Run this way! The zombies drew closer and closer. Steve could feel the heat of their foul breath. Come on, man, Peter coached. Run this way! You can run right through them! We gotta lead him away from here! With one deep breath, Steve sized up the corridor. It would be a squeeze, but there was room to run past the creatures. Come on, fly boy, you can make it. Come on, Peter cried. With a sudden jerky move, Steve broke into a run. He passed the first zombie easily. The second made a grab as he passed, but Steve kept his footing even though he slammed against the wall of the corridor, practically crushing his shoulder. A sharp pain shot through his right side. He kept moving forward. He knew to stop would mean certain death. The third zombie loomed in his path. Like a charging bull, Steve lowered his head and slammed into the ghoul's chest. The creature fell back, flying against the wall. Steve fell as well and tumbled toward the mouth of the passageway. He regained his footing as the creatures, now standing once again, turned to pursue him. Now! Hit for the department store! Go! Peter told him as he ran to the end of the hall where the big trooper waited. In unison, the two men ran across the balcony. They slammed into two other zombies that clutched and grabbed at them without success. Steve followed Peter to where Roger was firing at still another creature that was getting too close. It fell right under the balcony entrance arch of the big store. 
Other zombies approached, but Steve and Peter dove into the arch in time, and the three men managed to lower the gate without a problem. The zombies converged on the area as they had before, still clawing, clutching, and shoving the metal cage, but they were unable to enter. It held them out securely. The three men moved away, each giving silent thanks for their close escape. As they backed away, the only sound was of their heavy, exhausted breathing. Downstairs again, Peter said after a moment's rest. Same trick. They moved through the aisles of the store and crashed down the escalator. What do we do? Steve sputtered when they reached the first floor and ran toward the lower gate, wheezing with exhaustion. Let him know we're here, Roger said. He started to shout, Woo-hoo! Over here! Yee-haw! Steve started to laugh, out of relief, and also at the ludicrousness of the situation. Peter smiled at him for the first time. You did all right this time, Flyboy. How about it? He said with genuine feeling. Steve laughed some more. It was nervous at first, but soon it built into a real, wholehearted belly laugh. Whoopee! He let out long and loudly. The new kid on the block had been accepted, and he felt just like a child again. They all hugged each other with the joy of their victory, and a temporary victory was better than none at all. Chapter 7 After a few minutes of whooping it up with the other men, the reality of the situation hit Stephen squarely in the jaw, and he felt sick. His body wavered for a second, and he felt weak in the knees. But it was also a good feeling, a feeling that he could do anything he wanted to as long as he put his mind to it. His family had always been a cerebral one, and he had never been taught the pure joy that comes from physical accomplishment. Now, as he stood sweating and panting with the two troopers, he felt a strange calmness overcome him. But the pleasant feeling was short-lived. The three men continued to shout at the creatures through the cage, and the repulsive beasts were already gathering at the gate. The zombies had lost all of the individuality they had when they were human, but Steve noticed that they were of many shapes, sizes, and ages, some with the horrible wounds that had caused their deaths. There was a middle-aged, gray-haired man in a business suit, a housewife possibly in her forties in an apron, a well-dressed young woman, once attractive, with long blonde hair, in a skirt and sweater, probably an office worker. There were some children, about 10 to 13, who looked like they'd just come home from school. A construction worker with a beard, a young black man with an afro and wire-rimmed glasses, and a grandmother type with a gray bun at the back of her neck. A few more men in nondescript work clothes hung around the gate, but it didn't much matter what any of them had been in their former lives. They were all horrible and partially decomposed now, and their strength had nothing to do with their appearance. The youngest were most repulsive, as many had died of violent causes and not of old age. Peter had warned Steve not to soften when a child or older woman approached him. They were all deadly. Out on the concourse, a few zombies wandered aimlessly, but most of them turned toward the direction of the first floor department store arch, where the men were doing their best to stir up a racket. On the upstairs balcony, the creatures that had collected there were again moving toward the stationary steps and the escalators. The three creatures that Steve had battled with in the administrative corridor moved toward the open mall. Two walked out on the balcony, but the third turned into an open office. They seemed as stiff-legged and awkward as wind-up dolls. The last one staggered back out, spun around, and headed down the hall toward the fire stair. Fran, who had been waiting nearly an hour for Steve's return, heard the faint whooping of the men as she moved toward the stairway door that was still open. She couldn't imagine what the sound was for. It seemed like a celebration of some sort. And then the horrid thought crossed her mind. What if they had cracked under the pressure? 
Or what if Steve were dead and Peter and Roger were happy? She stopped herself from those silly thoughts. Sitting up here alone was making her crazy. She was starting to imagine the wildest things. She wished Steve would hurry back. She stepped out into the landing and looked down into the vast murkiness of the fire stair. Suddenly the shouting stopped. The silence was worse and she felt desperate with fear. The trembling began and she moved back into the storage room and then back onto the landing. She didn't know where to turn. Where the hell were Steve, Roger, and Peter? Who did they think she was leaving her here all alone? She wasn't a child. She could be of some use. But all they wanted to do was play soldier and leave her up in this godforsaken room with a bunch of cartons. Shit! She screamed out to the empty landing, her fear turning to anger. She took a few steps down the stairway. She thought she saw something moving in the dark. Frozen with fear, she stopped on the third stair from the top, turned around and ran back up. God damn it! The screaming seemed to help. At least she heard the sound of a human voice, even though it was only her own. Once more, she started down the steps. She wanted to see what was happening, but she really should have been armed. Steve had taken the only other rifle. In the corridor below, the creature wandered into another office and then spun around and walked out again as if it were playing some insane game with itself. We just gotta wait longer before we move, Roger told Steve and Peter as they crouched in the shadows of the aisles. The zombies crashed against the first floor gate like a huge wave. The gate held fast. No, there's always a chance of some of them staying up on the balcony, Peter replied. Yeah, but we can handle that, Roger said, shifting position but staying down low. We can break through. If any of them see us or hear us, they'll just follow us on up. It's no good. We can sure as hell outrun them. Load up what we can and get out of here, the big man thought for a second. Then he said, seriously, I'm thinking, maybe we got a good thing going here. Maybe we shouldn't be in such a hurry to leave. Oh, man. Roger looked disappointed. He pounded his right fist into his other hand and wouldn't face Peter. If we could get back up there without them catching on, we could hold up for a while. At least long enough to catch a breath. Check out the radio, see what's happening. Man, I don't know. Steve sat up and then crawled over to the troopers. There's some kind of passageway over the top of the stores. The troopers looked at the young pilot, almost surprised to hear him speak. They had expected that he'd be too shell-shocked from his experience to utter a sound. I don't know if it's just heating ducts or it's some kind of access. I saw it on a map. Upstairs. Peter gave the command. Let's go. The three moved off down the aisles, then ducked out of sight around the corner. As if they were imprisoned against their will, the zombies clutched and grabbed at the metal gate, moaning and rattling the grid loudly. In the maintenance hallway, the lumbering zombie tripped over the thick manual lying on the floor. Then it walked blindly into another office, ignoring the book as well as the corpses that littered the corridor. Fran had made it to the middle landing of the fire stair. Suddenly, she was overcome by a wave of nausea. She held her stomach, retching. Beads of sweat broke out on her forehead and she felt dizzy. She practically fell to the landing and sat there, letting her head flop against the wall. She could taste the salt of her tears. She had never been so miserable in her life. And what a life it was, too. She didn't know what would happen in the next few minutes, let alone the next few years. And what would happen to the life within her? What future was there for the child that she carried inside? Watch it. Don't let them see you. Peter told the men as the upstairs doors of the department store elevator opened and they trotted out. As they cleared the wall, they could see the entrance arch. There were no zombies at the gate, but two were seen drifting along the balcony outside. The men moved stealthily along the aisles. Above them in the ceiling was a series of large grillwork panels. Peter shone his flashlight beam into one. Looks big enough to crawl through, Roger said, as they observed the ceiling that was about 12 feet high. 
The light beam penetrated the grill to reveal a fairly large space above. They're locked, Peter told him. Damn, that's those other lock numbers we saw on the chart. Why the hell would they be locked? Steve asked. Jackpot, flyer boy, Peter said, patting Steve on the back. You're all right. What? Roger spun around, confused. They're locked because you can get through them easy from the other part of the building. Peter explained to his two comrades. Over here, Steve called to them. He had noticed that one of the ceiling grids were very close to the elevators. Peter looked at the grid and then down at the double doors. The elevator shaft. It was as if a light bulb had gone on in his head. He ran over and hit the button. The doors flew open. Hold them, Peter instructed Roger. Roger stood against the rubber safety bumper, holding the car doors open wide. Peter stepped up on the hand railing that ran around the car, and he reached up for the escape hatch that was held in place by four nub-headed bolts. He removed the bolts quickly and was able to dislodge the hatch cover and pass it down to Steve. Then he stuck his head up through the opening. It's here. His voice sounded muffled. He shone his flashlight back and forth in the darkness. He could see another grid in the wall of the shaft. Got a screwdriver and something to stand on for in here. I know where the tools are, Roger volunteered. Get one of those tables, he told Steve. As Roger ducked off down an aisle, Steve moved to the nearby furniture department, where he grabbed the lightweight lamp table. The elevator doors closed like the jaws of a shark. He had to hit the button again and wait for the doors to reopen. Peter had already hoisted himself up and was climbing out of the car and up into the shaft. Steve used the first table to hold the door open, and he went to get another. This time he came back with a large coffee table. He set it under the opening in the car and set the smaller table on top of it. It looked like a two-tiered cake. Then he climbed up, sticking his head up into the shaft. The doors closed again, leaving him in the small compartment in relative darkness. It's all right, Peter said as he examined the wall grid with his flashlight. It was filled with cables and elevator mechanisms and covered by a greasy black film. You found it, flower boy. He spoke softly, but his voice had an eerie, echoing sound in the narrow shaft. The car door opened again and Steve ducked down to see Roger, who bore a screwdriver and pliers along with some other tools in a shopping bag. One stop shopping, he said cheerfully. Anything you need right at your fingertips. Steve relayed the tools up to Peter, who immediately began to work on the screws that mounted the grid into the wall frame. He passed the flashlight to Steve, who held the beam steady on the work area. The men worked in silence, each instinctively knowing his task and performing it with speed and precision. Fran sat in the stairwell. The nausea had subsided, but she was afraid to move. She bit into the hand that she held across her mouth to keep from crying. She could feel all the pulse points in her body at her throat, her heart, her wrist, beating furiously. In the silence, she heard a faint click, and she felt a wave of relief flood her as she thought it might be Stephen. She stared at the bottom landing, hoping to see Steve's familiar shape in the shadows. Then there was a thump, as if something had fallen against the door, and Fran knew that her hopes would not be fulfilled yet. Those weren't the quick steps of Steve or the other two outside. Those were the lumbering, clumsy actions of one of the living dead. Slowly, Fran stood a scream of fright rising in her throat, her eyes transfixed on the door below. Stephen, she emitted. The door slowly opened. The crack of light grew larger and larger. The plodding, sluggish figure of the zombie moved into the fire stair. The light from the corridor illuminated the figure and made it seem tremendous. Its gigantic shadow appeared on the wall, Choking back a scream, Fran turned and ran up the stairs. She could hear the creature's steady, heavy footsteps following her up. Occasionally, it would bump into the wall or trip, unsure in the dim light. Panting and gasping for air, Fran made it to the top and into the storage area and slammed the door. For a moment, she just backed away in terror, her mind a blank. 
Then she snapped back to consciousness and started to drag the good cartons over to use as a barricade. But the cartons were extremely bulky and heavy, and she struggled with one that was so large that she couldn't get a good grip. The smooth cardboard slipped out of her hands. She could hear the zombie's footsteps on the middle landing and anxiety gripped her. With one great heave, she managed to shove the carton over against the door and move to haul another. She felt weak and dizzy, and the thought passed through her mind that she might give herself a miscarriage. But it only stunned her for a moment that she would think that, and then she went on. She could now hear the zombie at the top landing and sense that it was trying to open the door. Before she was able to bring another carton over, the door moved slightly. She threw herself against it all 110 pounds, but she knew that it wouldn't do any good. She had to lean over the carton against the door and couldn't get a proper footing on the slippery floor. As if in slow motion, the door moved a fraction of an inch at a time. Then the creature's wounded and bloody hand appeared at the edge of the door. Its mutilated fingers clutched the edge, smearing blood all over it. Fran backed away in terror and ran toward the escape pyramid. Then she turned suddenly and faced the door. The creature was straining against the weight of the carton. Now, both its hands clutched the edge of the door. The carton moved another inch and then another. The creature's head could now be seen as it strained to get through the widening space. Fran's eyes were wide with fright, mesmerized by the approaching ghoul. She looked around for something to use as a weapon, but the room was almost bare, except for the cartons and the water drums. In a split-second decision, she thought to run for the skylight. The creature would never be agile enough to follow her up there. Just as she was about to mount the pyramid, she caught sight of Roger's knapsack in the shadows. She ran for it as the creature finally broke into the room, shoving aside the heavy carton. Fran's hands began to tremble as she rummaged through the cloth bag. To her dismay, nothing seemed appropriate. She dumped the contents out on the floor, ammunition, mace cans, batteries, flares. Her heart leaped when she saw the cylindrical containers, and she nervously grabbed one up, her shaking hands trying to deal with the paper wrapping. The zombie moaned as it drew nearer. It was approaching the pyramid of cartons. Fran managed to free the wrapping, and she snapped the cylinder in two at the mark. As she turned, she realized that the zombie was now between her and the pyramid, cutting off her immediate escape route. Its lumbering steps were bringing it nearer and nearer. Fran backed away a few steps as she tried to strike the head of the flare and the small striker at the tip of the cylinder cap. It wouldn't fire. She tried again. And again. Now the zombie had reached the knapsack. It staggered over the spilled contents, knocking the other flares rolling about the floor. Finally, Fran was able to get her flare to light, and it caught with a great blast of air. The bright whooshing flame startled the woman as well as the creature. Its eyes went wide, and it brought its arms up so as to cover its eyes. The intense white flame cast an eerie light over the creature and threw the zombie's enormous shadow against the cartons and the wall. The creature backed away from the flame a few steps, almost tripping over the articles on the floor. All fear was gone from Fran now. She had an objective. And as long as she didn't think about what was happening, about what she was battling, then she was fine. She managed to advance close enough to snatch up two extra cylinders. Then she skirted around the zombie in a wide arc. The creature swatted at the air with its arms, keeping its distance, but still threatening. Fran considered making a run for the door to the fire stair, but then she thought that she might run into others, and she didn't want to leave this hiding place open to more invaders. Finally, she decided to climb the pyramid and try to escape onto the roof. She circled around to a point where she could climb up from behind the moaning zombie. She rushed for the cartons and started to climb, but she lost her footing, trying to hold the flares in both hands, and she crashed into the topmost carton. In a second's time, the momentum caused the carton to slide off, and Fran was unable to prevent it. The heavy case tumbled to the floor, almost crashing into the zombie. The creature started to clutch and grab at the cardboard pyramid. Since the stack of cartons was now one too short, Fran was only able to reach the mouth of the skylight with her hands, 
but didn't have the strength in her arms to pull herself up. Accidentally, she dropped two of the flares, including the lit one. With a sinking feeling, Fran realized that the flare had not only tumbled to the floor, but landed behind the pyramid where it no longer offended the ghoul's eyes. Now the thing tried to mount the cartons. Fran struck the last flare in her mouth and reached up with both hands for the edge of the skylight. She lifted with all her might, her feet coming off the carton tops, but she still couldn't pull herself up. The muscles in her arms strained, but they didn't have the necessary power. Now she tried to lower her feet back on the cartons, but the zombie's movement caused the pyramid to shake and wobble. The creature unbelievably was making progress, and it could almost touch Fran's foot. During Fran's ordeal, the three men were making their way through the crawl space in the ceiling. It was an area of large ductwork that seemed to run the length of the mall. Roger looked down through a grid. He could see the interior of a sporting goods store. Sweet Jesus, he exclaimed when he saw that along one wall was displayed an arsenal with the latest in weaponry for the sportsman. I seen it, Peter concurred. Come on. They moved as quietly as they could. Several side tunnels branched off in both directions from the one they were in. Steve passed another ceiling grid, and he could see a fully equipped radio and electronic shop. I hope you know where you're going, Roger said to Peter, who was leading them in the dark tunnel. This is it. Come on. He dropped out of the ceiling grid, landing in a plush office. It had the same color scheme as the executive offices, but everything was of a much more expensive quality. Roger's legs appeared through the open grid, and then he too swung down, holding on as long as he could with his hands so as to soften his landing. Suddenly, the two troopers felt the presence of another person in the room. Roger turned and was shocked to see a slumped figure in a large chair at the desk. Startled, Roger grabbed for his gun. Peter just stood there, open-mouthed and staring at the dead man in the chair. They were obviously in Porter's office. Plaques and diplomas, photographs of Porter with presidents and high government officials dotted the walls. Some days earlier, when the reports of widespread looting and rampaging armies of zombies had come into Porter's office through his personal teletype machine, he had taken his own life. It just wasn't worth fighting to save what he had spent his whole life building up from a horde of mindless creatures. That explained why the door had been locked when Roger and Peter had explored the executive corridor earlier. Come on, Peter said, stirring out of his stupor first. Steve's legs wiggled above. Just drop, I got you, Peter told the neophyte. I can't, I, came the muffled reply. The desk, Peter said to Roger, give me a hand. The two troopers took hold of the big desk and slid it away from the president's corpse. The action made the body's chair spin slightly, and its wide, terrified eyes seemed to watch the action. With the desk in place, Steve's toes were able to reach the surface. He lost his balance and pulled back up. Then he kicked the picture frame off the desk and it fell to the floor, shattering the glass over the photos of the president's wife and children. Come on, Peter urged again. Steve finally managed to get his footing on the desktop, and he lowered himself into the room. He stared at the corpse in the big chair, a totally unexpected sight that startled him more than the zombies whom he was used to by now. Peter had already moved to the door and was unlocking it so that they could enter the corridor. He opened it a crack and peered out. The corridor was empty except for the dead zombies. At the end that opened onto the mall, he could see the cart full of supplies. As the other men came up behind him, Peter opened the door quietly and slipped into the hall. He started to walk as quietly as he could toward the cart. The other men, according to the plan, moved backward up the corridor toward the fire stair. Roger kicked the corpses to one side, making a path for the cart. Peter grabbed the handles of the cart and started to pull it down the corridor, walking backward so that he was always facing the mall opening on the lookout for possible intruders. In the corridor, Stephen snatched up the maintenance manual that had been trampled on by the zombie upstairs. 
Peter backed slowly up the hall. The wheels of the car squeaked, and Peter bit his lip with the anxious thought that the sound might attract the attention of an aimlessly wandering creature. Roger kicked the last corpse close to the corridor wall. Suddenly, Steve noticed that the door to the fire stair was wide open. Jesus Christ, he shrieked, bounding toward the door. Roger spun around, surprised by Steve's violent outburst. Peter turned around, too, and saw what upset Steve. He quickened his pace, pulling the cart with him. Come on, you got it, Roger encouraged Peter. Steve trotted off up the stairs. After Peter had pulled the cart to safety inside the stairway, Roger ran up the stairs, too. Steve broke into the storage area, dropping the manual. Franny! Fran turned in Steve's direction, not believing her ears. The zombie, who had been steadily gaining on Fran, continued to swat at the flare that Fran had managed to light and sent it flying out of her hand. She was startled, and the cartons felt as if they were going to topple, too. She tried to hold herself steady with both hands. The creature grabbed at her kicking legs. Steve raised his rifle and moved in for a closer shot. Roger came charging through the door. Don't shoot, they'll hear you. He ran to the pyramid with Steve. The creature was still clutching at Fran. She kicked violently as Roger pulled the back of the zombie's clothing. The combined force caused the creature to hit the floor. Just as it was about to kneel and stand up, Steve brought the rifle around like a baseball bat, smashing the butt into the thing's head. Then, for good measure, Roger delivered a blow with his gun, straight down, like a battering ram. Steve dropped his rifle and rushed to Fran. As if all the strength had been drained from her, she fell off the cartons into his arms, sobbing and choking. Franny, Steve asked, his voice cracking. Are you all right? You okay, Franny? Hey. There was true concern in his voice. But the woman was incoherent. She babbled between tears and sobs, clutching her stomach. Peter appeared in the doorway, carrying the TV and several other items. He dumped them on the floor. He glanced at Fran briefly, but didn't offer any assistance or sympathy for her terrible experience. Let's get this stuff up, come on, he said to Roger gruffly. Roger dragged the dead zombie toward the door. Peter walked over to help. At that moment, Fran started to retch. Frazzled Steve tried to calm her. He ran over to the water can and brought her some water in an empty spam can. Franny, it's okay, come on, it's okay. But you hurt, hon. Did you hurt yourself? Franny. She looked up at him, tears streaming down her face. She seemed as if she wanted to stop, but the sobbing was too intense and she couldn't control it. All the fears and terror that she had been holding in burst like floodgates. Meanwhile, Peter was downstairs at the door to the corridor. He peeked out and could see into the mall at the far end. The coast was clear, and he and Roger hurriedly carried the corpse into the hall and rolled it onto the floor. Then they retreated back into the fire stair. Peter held the door open slightly and watched the corridor for a moment. I think we're okay, brother, he said to Roger, convinced that they hadn't been seen. He closed the door quietly. Grabbing more supplies from the cart, they started upstairs. We're okay. We're all okay. Steve was telling Fran, trying to comfort her. We got a lot of stuff, all kinds of stuff. In the background, the two troopers brought their load of supplies into the big room and deposited them near the TV. Mechanically, as soon as they dropped off one load, they went down for another. This is a terrific place, Franny, Steve was saying, wiping the perspiration-drenched hair from her eyes. She was still sobbing and retching. This place is perfect. We got it made in here. Franny. Once more, the enormous barricade of food cartons was stacked against the door. A calm pervaded the little fortress, the silence broken only by the noise of rustling paper and chewing as the survivors ate. A faint electronic whistle threaded through the background. The refugees were sitting near the pyramid on the floor. Peter seemed to be sleeping, sitting up against the structure. Roger was nibbling at the delicacies from Porter's gourmet department, 
known all over the East Coast for its fine food. Around them, as if they were children after Christmas, lay their loot. Roger leaped through the maintenance binder as he ate, as casually as if it were the Sunday paper. In reality, they didn't know what day it was and weren't even sure of the time. No one had bothered to rewind watches or mark the passing days in a calendar. All normal functions, except for the very basic ones, had ceased. Around them lay a stack of tools, some still in wrappings, electric razors still boxed, some clothing articles, including the leather jacket that Roger had admired, the radio that could also play small cassettes of audio tape. In addition, there were soaps, toiletries, pens, pencils, and notebooks, flashlights, cigarettes, and several decks of playing cards with a canister of chips. The quantity of necessary items was in inverse proportion to the quality of leisure items that could have been found in a family room or den. The three figures were bathed in the blue glow from the television screen that Steve tried to tune in. Its power cable was spliced into the leads of a bare light fixture overhead. Fran slept behind some cartons. Her sobbing had finally subsided and left her weak and tired. What the hell time is it anyway? Roger asked, annoyed that there was nothing on the tube. Only about nine, Steve surmised. Roger nodded his head toward the portable set. And nothing? The only thing coming from the set was the high-pitched whine that the Civil Defense sent out, and only the CD logo appeared on the screen. As long as we're getting the pattern, that means they're sending, Steve said matter-of-factly. Roger snapped on the large battery-powered radio. He rolled the dial around, but all he got was static. Finally, he heard a signal, and he tuned it in. A badly modulated voice droned through the interference. It sounded as if it were a war correspondent sending a signal from very far away. Steve clicked off the TV set so that they would better be able to hear the announcer. Reports that communications with Detroit have been knocked out, along with Atlanta, Boston, and certain sections of Philadelphia and New York City. Philly, Roger said almost to himself. I know WGON is out by now, Steve said with animation. It was a madhouse back there. People are crazy if they just organize. It's total confusion. I don't believe it's gotten this bad. I don't believe they can't handle it. He looked around the room proudly. Look at us. Look at what we were able to do today. A few feet away, still in a slump position by the pyramid of cartons, Peter's eyes blinked open. He had been listening to what he wanted to hear. And now this statement by the kid really made him take notice. His eyes moved slightly to the side so that he could watch Stephen. The young man was gesturing wildly with his hands, going on and on about their exploits as a team. The other two didn't realize Peter was awake. Roger nodded his head, but it didn't seem as if he were really listening to Steve's ramblings. We knocked the shit out of them, and they never touched us, Steve exclaimed. Not really, he said in a quieter tone. The rumbling voice erupted from the other side of the room. They touched us good, flyboy. We're lucky to get out of here with our asses. You don't forget that. The two men looked at Peter. Steve's face colored at being caught mouthing off about something he really hadn't contributed to. The droning of the radio announcing more disaster reports was a counterpoint to Peter's speech. You get overconfident? underestimate those suckers, and you get eaten. How'd you like that? He spoke in a low, unemotional tone, barely turning his head so that Steve could see his expression. Peter hadn't moved a muscle except for his eyes and his mouth. Steve was transfixed. They got a big advantage over us, brother. Peter went on. They don't think. They just blind ass do what they got to do. No emotions. And that bunch out there, that's just a handful, and every day there'll be more. A couple hundred thousand people die each day from natural causes. That'll probably triple or better with folks knocking each other off the way it's going. Now each one of them comes back and kills two, and each one of them two more. 
You know about the Emperor's reward? As if they were children at story hours, the two grown men shook their heads. Peter went on. The Emperor tells this dude, I'll give you anything I got, name it. Dude puts out a chessboard. Says, give me one grain of rice on the first square, two on the second, four on the third, eight. Double for each square on the board. Do got all the rice in the kingdom, baby. Wipe the emperor out. Yeah, Steve interrupted. But these things can be stopped so easily if people would just listen, do what has to be done. Peter swiveled his upper torso and faced Steve. How about a fly boy? Let's say the lady gets killed. You'd be able to chop off her head? Steve was stopped mid-sentence by the last comment. It was meant to sting, and it did. He stared at the big man, his mouth open. He was just about to answer yes when he stopped himself again. All he could do in response was stare. Fran, who was trying to get some rest on the other side, opened her eyes wide as the conversation drifted by her. When Steve didn't answer, she sat up, thinking that he had lowered his voice. Sitting in the shadows behind a wall of cartons, she listened. But there was silence, except for the drone of the radio. Upset, she reached for her pack of cigarettes, part of the loot, and lit one. She was awfully disappointed in Steve. He let the bigger man bully him. He had always been so confident and so reliable. That was what had attracted him to her at the station. Her ex-husband had been afraid of his own shadow, but in his home, he tried to be the boss. Steve had always stood up to authority figures and spoke in his mind, but Peter could silence him with one look. It was frightening. The faint strains of the radio broadcast wafted through the room. The announcer sounded unprofessional. He didn't have the clipped Midwestern accent of most newscasters. His voice was tired and he stumbled on some words, taking long pauses between paragraphs. Gases are certain toxins that might affect the creatures. Experiments with hallucinogens have begun at Haverford in the hopes of producing an agent that will cloud the brain and prevent the effect of motor coordination of the body. However, scientists fear that the creatures function on a subconscious, instinctive level and that such drugs will have little or no effect. In Nevada, chemicals sprayed from crop-dusting airplanes have had more of an ill effect on the human population than on the walking corpses. Peter turned his attention from the broadcast. She all right? He asked Steve, referring to Fran. She looked blown. What did you expect? Roger asked, annoyed that Peter was being so hard on his friend. Steve wasn't a professional fighter like Peter and himself but Roger still thought he had done damn good under pressure. No, I mean, she really looked sick, physically. Steve looked at him long and hard. He was a difficult man to figure. He was one way one minute and a different person the next. She's pregnant, he said softly. There was a long, heavy silence. The radio droned on. Finally, Peter heaved a sigh and closed his eyes again, as though instantly falling asleep. How far along? asked Roger, a concerned look in his face. Three and a half. Four months. Jesus, Steve, he said, rubbing his head. Maybe we should try to get moving. Without opening his eyes, Peter spoke. We can deal with it. Yeah, but maybe she needs a doctor, or... Peter cut Roger off. We can deal with it. It doesn't change a thing. Now he opened his eyes again and looked hard at Steve. You want to get rid of it? Huh? Steve was shocked at the cold-hearted attitude. It wasn't even his decision to make. Peter ignored his shocked look. He seemed to enjoy making people squirm. Do you want to abort it? He repeated tensely. It's not too late. I know how. Tears streaked Fran's face. She strained her ears for Steve's retort. He should smash the bastard across the face, she thought. How dare he make that suggestion? And how dare Steven not speak up and say it's not his decision to make? Her heart pounded as she waited for the reply. 
The only sound was the droning radio. After a time, Fran heard Steve's footsteps rounding the corner to her sleeping area. He seemed surprised to see her sitting up. She was on one of the new blankets from the store. Another was rolled up as a pillow where her head had lain. She wiped away her tears, a lit cigarette still in her hand. Hey, Steve said, kneeling next to her. You okay? All your decisions made? He looked at her for a moment, speechless. Do you want to abort it? She asked pointedly. Do you? She met his question with silence. Looking away, she took another drag on the cigarette that was burning down so low it practically burned her fingers. Stephen sat next to her and put his hands on her shoulders. She looked into his eyes. So I guess we forget about Canada, right? Jesus, Franny. He said, taking her in his arms. This setup is sensational. We get everything we need. We seal off that stairway. Nobody will ever know we're up here. We'd never find anything like this. He seemed as though his mind was made up. The decision had been made by the Troika, the Triumvirate. And the opinion of one Franny Parker was in no regard. I guess nobody cares about my vote, huh? She pouted. Come on, Franny, I thought you were sleeping. She pulled away from him, the end of the cigarette growing smaller and smaller. What happened to growing vegetables and fishing? What happened to the idea about the wilderness, hundreds of miles from anything and anybody, Steve? I'm afraid. You're hypnotized by this place, all of you. It's all so bright and neatly wrapped that you don't see, you don't see. She leaned toward him, making a final plea. Stephen, let's just take what we need and keep going. We can't hardly carry anything in that little bird. He rationalized. What do you want? She said, her voice rising in anger. A new set of furniture, a freezer, a console TV and stereo? We can take what we need, what we need to survive. Peter's eyes popped open and he leaped up. Shut that thing off. He had the hearing of a trained dog. And it seemed as if he never slept, just closed his eyes. Roger clicked off the radio and they listened. Slight sounds were coming from the fire stair. The TV had been turned on again with the sound low, and the blue glow made the barricade of cartons look surreal. Roger crawled over and clicked the TV set off again. The electronic CD whistle died, and there was silence. Steve had heard Peter's outburst, and he stepped tentatively from behind the wall of cartons. Crawling on her hands and knees, Fran peered around the corner to look. There was another noise, sounding too familiar, just like the faint squeaking of the door at the bottom of the steps. Then footsteps on the metal stairs, slow, deliberate, heavy footsteps. The faces of all the refugees tightened. Peter and Roger pulled out their rifles and Roger readied his. They all tried to hold their breath to make as little noise as possible so that the intruder wouldn't know they were there. More thumping in the hall and Fran grabbed Steve's hand. He squatted down and held her. The sound seemed to be getting closer and closer. The door behind the cartons clicked but didn't move. Then there came an insistent pounding, slowly at first, then stronger. It kept up for a few minutes, yet it seemed an eternity for the occupants. And then there was silence. Peter gave everyone a look that meant, don't relax, the worst is not over. After a time, the footsteps receded down the stairs. Somebody better sit watch all the time, Peter pronounced, and the others shook their heads in agreement. They'll never get through there, Roger said, hoping that he was right. Enough of them will. Peter replied seriously. And it ain't just them things we gotta worry about. The chopper up there could give us away if somebody come messing around. What are they gonna do? Roger insisted. Land another pilot to fly it out? They're not gonna mess with a little bird like that. They got enough on their hands. You know, back in Philly, we found a boat in the middle of Independence Square. Somebody trying to carry it to the river, I guess. Didn't make it. 
Damn thing sat there for eight days. Somebody finally got it, though. It come down to how much it's worth. Peter laid his rifle against the side of the cart and then lit a cigarette. Fran ducked around and lay back down on her blanket. She lit another cigarette from the first and then ground the first one out in the cement. She was becoming a chain smoker from this experience. And to think that she was planning to give it up because of the baby. What did it matter now? Who knew if she would even get out alive? Franny. Steve came around and sat next to her again. She took a deep drag on the cigarette. Damn it, Fran. He looked at her earnestly. His brown hair was all matted, and there were smudges of grease in his hair from the trek through the ceiling ducts. He looked almost comical. You know how many times we'd have to land for fuel, trying to make it up north? Those things are out there everywhere, and the authorities would give us just as hard a time. Maybe worse. We're in good shape here, Franny. We got everything we need right here. Steve curled up with his head on the rolled blanket. He held out his arms to her. Come on, get some sleep. She still didn't respond or move toward him. Franny, come on. Grinding her second cigarette out on the floor, she stretched out next to Steve. Tentatively, he put his arm around her. When she didn't push it off, he tightened his hold and then began rubbing his hand up and down her body as he curled next to her, staring into her eyes that seemed to be focused elsewhere. He opened her blouse and reached inside. He closed his eyes and seemed to relax in the comfort of her softness. His hand moved under her clothing. Fran still hadn't spoken, and her face was set in a grim, thoughtful expression. At first, she didn't respond physically at all. But then at Steve's insistence, she relaxed her body, and she brought one of her arms up around his head. I'm not just being stubborn. He told her softly as his hands explored her hardening nipples under her clothing. I really think this is better. Hell, you're the one's been wanting to set up house. She continued to stare off across the barren room impassively. In the administration corridor, all was quiet. A few stray zombies wandered among the corpses on the floor. One large and severely wounded creature came out of the fire stair, probably the one that had been pounding on the door upstairs. A female zombie dressed in jeans and a sweater in her early 20s squatted near one of the corpses in the hall. She lifted its arm and moved it to her mouth, but she dropped it quickly, repelled by its coldness. Then she leaned over and picked at another corpse, just like someone at a smorgasbord. This one was cold, too. Discouraged, the zombie stood and drifted toward the mall. Slowly, the creatures left the corridor and moved out onto the second floor balcony. The central mall was strewn with the bodies of their not-so-lucky comrades. Here and there, a few zombies squatted and finished off their dinner. Meanwhile, the radio in the upper room droned on and lulled the inhabitants to a fitful sleep. Not actually cannibalism. Cannibalism, in the true sense of the word, implies an intraspecific activity. These creatures cannot be considered human. They prey on humans. They do not prey on each other. On the mall balcony, zombies wandered past the stores, as if out for a Sunday stroll. Some moved down the stationary stairs onto the main concourse below. More and more zombies had been filing in from the surrounding communities, as if their normal lives continued. Schools, offices, and shopping malls continued to attract the walking dead. The huddled bodies of Steve and Fran were intertwined behind the curtains. Roger was stretched out in a sleeping bag that he had found in the camping department. Only Peter slept sitting up, at his post near the fire door, his rifle slung across his lap. The radio continued. They attack and, and feed only on warm human flesh. Intelligence. Seemingly little or no reasoning power. What basic skills remain are more remembered behaviors from, from normal life. There are reports of the creatures holding tools, but even these actions are the most primitive, the use of external articles as bludgeons, etc. 
Even animals will adopt the basic use of the tools in this manner. At the mall entrance, some of the creatures drifted out into the night, while others entered the enormous building. Although there were not as many as there had been in the afternoon, the number was enough to be reckoned with. Several creatures continued to claw at the roll gate to porters. In a strange and eerie montage, the staring painted eyes of the mannequins inside seemed to watch the zombies on the outside. The rattle of the gate mingled with the droning, fading sound of the music. Chapter 8 These creatures are nothing but pure, motorized instinct. A gravelly voice was saying to her. She shook her head, looking about for the person who belonged to the disembodied voice, and realized that she had been sleeping and the voice that had wakened her was only the television. Her body was stiff from lying on the thin blanket on the cold cement floor. Couldn't those wise guys have thought to steal a mattress, she thought, as she tried to rub the stiffness out of her back. The morning sunlight spilled through the skylights above. Sitting up, Fran peered into the next area of the room. The television was playing to no one. The men were gone. On the tube, a disheveled man sitting in an emergency newsroom read the report. Their only drive is for the food that sustains them. We must not be lulled by the concept that these are our family members or our friends. They will not respond to such emotions. They must be destroyed on sight. Fran quickly glanced to make sure that the barricade was in place at the fire stair door. At least they weren't stupid enough to go on another search-and-destroy mission this morning, she thought. Looking up, she realized that the men must have gone up on the roof through the open skylight. At the edge of the roof, Peter looked through binoculars. To the untrained eye, it would have looked like a lovely countryside, the mist rising as the sun climbed higher in the sky. But Peter knew better. About a quarter of a mile away, he saw the large warehouse of a food processing chain probably owned by an old man porter, he thought to himself. And considering the state he's in now, he certainly wouldn't mind lending the survivors a hand. In the yard and in the large open garages of the building, Peter noticed a fleet of enormous trailer trucks that were parked in rows. A plan was forming in his mind. He had explained the germ of it to Steve and Roger over their breakfast of lukewarm instant coffee and spam. You sure we can start them? Steve had asked. You haven't spent enough time on the street, Roger chimed in. Starting cars, especially these big semis, was Roger's specialty. He had practically learned it at his daddy's knee. When his daddy was home from the road, that is. Well, let's get it up, Peter barked. He was never one for idle chatter, and for all the time they'd been together, Steve and Roger still felt that Peter was a stranger. He hadn't opened up once or said anything personal except for the few short minutes of conversation in the chopper. There's not too many of them around yet this morning, Peter continued, looking at the parking lot below. The parking lot was dotted with the lumbering figures. There were fewer than there had been the day before, and they wandered aimlessly, spread out rather than in clusters. The men walked toward the skylight. In the storage area below, Fran examined the maps in the manual. The TV droned on. It was a familiar sound now, almost like white noise. They didn't hear it when it was on, but if it were off, they'd notice it. Hey, Fran, Roger called in a friendly tone as the men made their way down to the room. I would have made coffee and breakfast, but I don't have my pots and pans, she said bitterly. Roger laughed, thinking it a joke, but Steve could sense the tension in Fran's face and waited for her to explode. Peter seemed preoccupied with his equipment and hadn't even acknowledged Fran's presence. Can I say something? she asked. Sure. What do you mean? Steve said gently, hoping to forestall any argument. She looked at the three men who had stopped their fiddling around and stood waiting for her to go on. I'm sorry you found out that I'm pregnant. Because I don't want any of you to treat me any differently than you treat another guy. 
Steve blushed and looked around at the other men. Hey, Franny, come on. And, she went on, shooting Steve a deadly look. I'm not gonna be a den mother for you guys. They all looked at her now, even Peter, giving her their undivided attention. And I wanna know what's going on. And I want something to say about the plans. There's four of us, okay? Jesus, Fran! Steve bellowed, putting his hand to his head. She was really blowing it now. They probably thought she was a hysterical female, Steve decided. Fair enough, Peter chimed in, a smile on his face. For the life of him, Steve couldn't figure that one out. Now, Fran went on, picking up confidence. What's going on? We're going out, Peter said. But this time he wasn't smiling. Franz started to say something, but at this point he cut her off. And you're not coming with us. Franz started to turn red in protest. Peter had made believe that he agreed with her, and now he was back to being his same overbearing male chauvinist pig self. You will not come with us until you can handle yourself. He said slowly and deliberately as if he were speaking to a child. That means you learn to shoot and learn to fight. He turned, not even waiting for her reply, and started back up the pyramid. Roger followed his head down. He couldn't look Fran in the eye. Something else. She said it with determination. She wasn't going to let Peter step all over her as he did to Roger and Steve. They all turned to look at her again. This time, she faced Roger and Peter directly without giving a second glance to Stephen. I don't know about you two, but I want to learn how to fly that helicopter. Stephen's mouth fell open, and he looked at Fran in disbelief. She glared at him and then lowered her eyes. If anything happens, we've got to be able to get out of here. Stephen was speechless. Not only was Fran humiliating him in front of the two troopers, but she was implying that he was dispensable. He looked at her and then at the others. He could feel a flush spreading up from his neck. She's right, flyer boy. Peter chimed in. Come on, let's go. And you're not leaving me without a gun again. Stephen started to protest, but then he changed his mind. Dejected, he set his rifle down on the cartons and fished in his pocket for a fistful of shells, dumping them next to the gun. He stared at Fran as if he were a beaten dog both angry and hurt. I just might be able to figure out how to use it, she said, as she picked up the weapon and shot a glance up at Peter. The two troopers disappeared through the skylight. Stephen seemed frozen to the spot, focusing on a speck of dirt on the floor. I'm sorry, Stephen, Fran said, moving close to his side. But it wasn't an apology. I know. I know. It's all right. He started up to the skylight. Stephen, she said soothingly. Yeah. He stopped and turned to look at her. She seemed to be crying out for understanding, but he was incapable of running to her. She had damaged him in front of Peter and Roger, and he had tried so hard to gain their respect. Now, by standing up to him, defying him, and showing the troopers that she wanted to be on her own... They probably thought less of him. But Fran's intention wasn't to hurt his masculine image. And this was something Steve couldn't fathom. Fran could see in his eyes that he didn't understand the necessity of her actions. She shrugged off whatever she was going to say and sighed with exasperation. Be careful, she said tonelessly, as if by rote. Yeah, we'll be all right. He disappeared through the skylight. Fran stared down at the weapon in her hand and then stepped over and clicked off the television set. It was ironic, but this situation was teaching her more about Stephen than she could ever have imagined. It was sad, too, that with their lives in the line, they had to deal with such pettiness. The experience was also teaching Fran a lot about herself that she hadn't realized before. It was teaching her that she had a lot more strength than she had ever thought, and that she didn't always need a man to lean on. 
Stephen entered the pilot seat of the chopper. He was really upset by Franny's actions. He started the controls, and the sudden loud noise of the chopper engine made him jump. Roger and Peter ran over, ducked under the whirling blades, and got in. Slowly, the bird lifted off the rooftop. The plan was for Steve to fly the chopper over to the tractor-trailer parking field and let the troopers off. Once in the big trucks, Roger would hotwire the motors and they would drive the trucks over to the various entrances to the shopping mall and park them flush against the doors, preventing the outside zombies from entering and the inside zombies from leaving alive. As Steve hovered above, Roger worked on the wiring beneath the dashboard of one of the big trailer trucks. His fingers worked nimbly, as skilled and trained as a surgeon's. Peter was in the cab of another rig already started by Roger. He tried the complicated shift mechanisms and fidgeted with the other controls. Then he pulled the big semi out of its parking space and stopped his cab just abreast of the cab Roger was working in. How about it? He called over the roar of the engine. Getting it, Roger called back. Peter looked around the mall parking lot and out to the mall in the distance. On the ground, there were a few zombies scattered about in little clusters but none of them seemed to present any imminent danger. So far, they hadn't noticed the activity going on over by the garage. Roger sat up and the truck vibrated steadily. I'll just ride pickup, Peter shouted across the gap between the two trucks. I'm not too sure of this thing. I grew up in one of these, Roger returned, his eyes lighting up like a child's. Let's go. The huge vehicles pulled away from the warehouse. They rode across the little loading lot and down a ramp toward the roadway. Stephen hovered overhead in the chopper, following the trucks as closely as he could. It was difficult since they had to ride a while before the trucks could gather any speed up a slight incline. But once the giant trucks picked up speed, there was no stopping them. Fran was up on the roof of the mall, clutching the rifle to her chest. She could make out the big trailers in the distance and watch them roar over the hill, the helicopter wavering above them. It was a strange-looking convoy speeding toward the shopping center. Along the road, several zombies tried to stagger after the trucks, but they were left in the dust of the barreling vehicles. As the wind whipped by them, they wavered slightly but continued their sluggish, creeping pace. The vehicles pulled into the long grade that loaded into the mall's parking lot. With a gigantic roar, they drove straight toward the building. At one of the building entrances, a gathering of zombies was moving in and out of the main doors like robots. Some wandered nearby in the parking lot. The area seemed to be filling up as the morning progressed. Some of the creatures were attracted by the sounds of the engines, and they turned and faced the trucks. As Peter pulled his vehicle in a wide arc, Roger drove his right up to the side of the building and roared toward the entrance doors. Then he skipped his right wheels up onto the curb and with a great scraping crunch, the big truck pulled directly abreast of the building, flush with the entrance. The tremendous truck crushed several of the helpless creatures and knocked them against the wall as if they were flags being squashed on a windshield. The trailer of the truck had effectively blocked off the mall entrance. Several zombies trapped inside tried to push the glass door open. The doors moved slightly but did not allow any room for the creatures to escape. The few creatures immediately around the truck began to clamor at its sides. Roger shut off the engine and grabbed his gun. Other zombies began clutching at the windows of the cab. Roger watched their ghoulish faces flush against the cab windows. Their nails made screeching sounds on the glass as they tried to gain entrance. Some of them pushed their faces up against the windows, making them look even more fiendish. Overhead, the chopper hovered like a bird in flight. With a rumble, Peter pulled up his big truck alongside so that his passenger door was directly abreast of the free door in Roger's cab. Peter's truck also crushed one or two of the creatures, but there were still several in the immediate vicinity of the cabs. They made a slight thud as they hit the wheels. As Roger opened his door and scrambled into the other truck, one of the zombies grabbed hold of his leg. Roger managed to kick the creature off just as the big truck pulled out and roared across the lot. The helicopter flew straight up and directly over the roof of the big shopping center where Fran had been watching the action. 
She had been fascinated and repulsed at the clockwork precision with that Roger and Peter worked. As she ran to the other side of the roof, the wind from the chopper whipped her hair. The chopper turned and waited for the big truck to move up under it. Then it escorted the trailer back to the warehouse down the road. In the cab that Peter was driving, Roger was jumping up and down in the seat, whooping it up like a cowboy. They pulled alongside another of the parked trucks. Come on, come on, Peter tried to calm him down. Three more, baby. Like a charm, huh? Roger was yelling for joy. Like a fucking charm! He grabbed his knapsack and climbed into the new cab. Immediately, all frivolity was forgotten, and he went to work on jumping the engine cables of the second rig. From the helicopter overhead, Steve spotted something moving around the warehouse. He jockeyed the chopper slightly for a better look and saw a small group of zombies wandering out of the big garage directly toward Roger's truck. It looked like a group of farmers. They were all wearing jeans and work boots. They all seemed to be moving more quickly than the lumbering ones in the parking lot. In the meantime, Peter's truck pulled away from the cab Roger was in. The big vehicle rolled into the large paved area behind the warehouse, where Peter was able to turn it around easily. Stephen swooped down with the copter buzzing as close as he could to Roger's truck, trying desperately to signal the man. But Roger was still immersed in his work on the cables. Every once in a while, he would remember their success and whoop like a child. The zombie group drew closer. They had just about reached the cab. Steve swooped low again and buzzed once more. Roger still didn't notice. Peter had now backed up into a position that enabled him to pull out. He looked up to see the helicopter heading straight for him. Is this guy losing his marbles, Peter thought? But then he saw the big chopper buzz right over his cab and spin around, heading back for Roger. It seemed to be some sort of signal. Peter looked toward the other truck. He was now able to see the lumbering creatures. Frantic, he tried to slam the truck into gear, but the complicated shift mechanism fought him. One of the approaching zombies reached Roger's truck and slammed its hands against the driver's side window. The man was startled and tried to untangle himself from his cramped position under the big steering wheel. For a terrible moment, he was stuck. Other creatures appeared at the passenger side of the cab, where the door was open. One of the zombies grabbed at Roger's leg. He kicked violently but couldn't seem to get a good position. He fell lower onto the floor of the cab, his body almost knotted among the controls and the shift sticks. With a lurch, Peter's truck started to roll, accelerating softly. From above, Steve tried to buzz the clutching ghouls, but they didn't even look up or flinch as the wind generated by the blades whipped through their hair and clothes violently. They were a frightening sight as they clawed and banged at Roger. The trooper's eyes were wide with fear and revulsion at being at the creature's mercy. He kicked and twisted his body to push them away, but he was unable to deliver a solid blow from his pinned position. Blindly, he groped for his rifle on the seat of the truck. Inadvertently, his finger hit the trigger, and the shell blasted through the chest of the lead creature. But the ghouls didn't react and kept clawing and grabbing as if nothing had happened. Finally, Peter was able to get his truck in the proper gear, and it started to roll a little faster. Desperately, he headed for Roger's cab. In the chopper, Steve realized that he could be of no assistance and hovered closer to get a better look at the action. He could see that Roger now had a good grip on his gun, but was unable to clear the weapon from around the gear sticks. To Steve's horror, he saw that the zombie who was now in the lead was actually scrambling into the cab with Roger and was all but on top of the struggling trapped trooper. Just as a second creature was about to claw his way in, Peter, now moving with a good amount of speed, swung his truck up and crushed it against the side of the cab. Blood splattered all over the truck and trickled to the ground. Meanwhile, Roger was frantically trying to keep the first zombie's mouth away. Its gaping hole was filled with rotted and blackened teeth, the two bodies entwined in a wrestler's hold. 
Even though the zombie was the weaker of the two, Roger was hampered by the position he was in. He had to channel all his force in an upward direction, thus losing most of its effectiveness. Peter, who had pulled his truck too fast past Roger's, now slammed his rig into reverse and backed up. This time, he managed to get his window in a direct line with the open door in Roger's cab. He raised his rifle and aimed, but he could not get a clear shot. The zombie had managed to pin Roger against the steering wheel, and the blonde trooper's head was directly in Peter's line of sight. The zombie's head was positioned behind Roger's. Get its head up! Get its head up! Peter shouted loudly, trying to overcome the noise of the truck engine and the hovering helicopter. Hearing the sound of a human voice, Roger realized that Peter was outside. He struggled with the creature, in the process dropping his rifle on the floor of the cab. It clanged against his tools. Finally, he managed to get a stranglehold on the creature's neck. He pushed up with all his might, but he couldn't budge the ghoul. The zombie's hands clutched at his face, its fingers pushing on Roger's eyes, and the pain was unbearable. In a split second, Peter saw the opportunity to fire at the zombie while it held Roger at arm's length. The gun gave out a deafening roar. The zombie's head flew apart. Remnants of blood and brain tissue splattered the inside of the cab and the driver's window. The gummy stuff flew into Roger's face, blinding him momentarily. He wiped away the wet matter, cringing when he realized what it was. The zombie fell limp, its dead weight crushing Roger against the controls of the cab. Desperate, blood running all over him, Roger frantically tried to free himself. With a great heave of his body, he pushed the leaden creature out of the cab. His eyes stared in terror and revulsion. Instantly, he brought his sleeve up to wipe the stains from his face, feeling the bits of flesh and blood caked to his skin and even on his lips. His body shook and quivered in disgust. A sudden crash brought Roger to his senses, and he spun around. One of the zombies had actually recalled the instinct to smash through the driver's side window with a tire chain. Roger was stunned for a minute that the creature could have managed such a feat. Still shaking, he dove to the floor for his weapon. Get down, stay down, Peter called, trying to level off a shot. I got it! He screamed, but once again he was unable to get off a shot because Roger was in the way. Roger, his adrenaline pumping overtime, sat up with his gun and leveled off at the creature himself. The shell crashed through the already shattered glass and squarely into the creature's head. Roger's body shuddered as the bullet hit. You bastards. You bastards. He started mumbling incoherently his voice quivering and a glazed look coming into his eyes. Suddenly, he gave a war whoop and looked at Peter, semi-deliriously shouting, We got him, buddy! We got him, didn't we? Cool it, man! Peter hissed at him over the noise of the big engine. Get your head! Peter had seen this reaction many times during combat. A soldier would do something that he found utterly repugnant but necessary. And if he couldn't accept what he'd done, his mind just snapped. He had seen it happen in Nam and on the streets of Philly. And sometimes the experience was so totally devastating that the trooper or cop or soldier never recovered. We got this by the ass! Got this by the ass! Roger leaped around in the cab, his face a fiery red, sweat pouring down his neck and collecting in a pool by his collarbone. He dove down again and started to work on jumping the truck. Hey, Raj, Peter said more gently. Get your head, man. Come on, we got a lot to do. Roger. There was a rustle of movement and then nothing from the floor of the cab. Peter looked about himself cautiously and then started to open his door and step out. When suddenly, Roger popped up again. The engine of the truck roared and Roger just smiled calmly at Peter, sending a steady gaze across the space between the two cabs. Let's go, baby, he said, as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. Number two. You all right? 
perfect, baby. Perfect, he said, gunning the engine happily and pulling the big vehicle out of the area. Peter followed, a look of confusion and concern on his face. As the two semis rumbled out of the warehouse lot and started down the grade toward the road, the helicopter followed suit. Stephen had craned his neck to watch the action, and his eyes had been wide with fascination as he observed the struggle below. He believed that Roger and Peter had more guts than anyone he'd ever known. He didn't think he could have lasted one minute in that cab with those creatures without puking his brains out. The trucks moved along at a fast pace. Suddenly, a few zombies loomed up before them as they ascended a grade. The creatures were walking slowly up the road. Roger's eyes widened with anger and he steered his rig right for the creatures. The front of the cab smashed into two of them. One was crushed under the wheels and the other flew back from the impact. Fran, too, had been watching with horror although from her vantage point, she could barely make out a thing. She had wished those jerks had thought to rip off some binoculars, but that was too easy. She should have made them a shopping list. At least they would have accepted that as part of her function. Now, anxiety was choking her. She could see the two trucks pull up over the rise. The helicopter buzzed along with them. Then the trucks roared around the entrance ramps into the parking lot, and again the chopper zoomed right over the roof. Fran trotted across the roof to see the action in the lot. The trucks rumbled toward the second set of entrance doors. Roger steered the huge trailer truck directly broadside with the doors. In the process, the vehicle knocked over several creatures and scraped against the building as the big trailer blocked off the entrance. This time... There were more creatures still alive in the immediate area. They clutched at the cab and leaped at the doors. Watching from above, Fran decided to take action. She seemed to become inspired from the real bravery that Roger and Peter had shown that morning. As the creatures converged on the truck, she aimed her rifle down at them. Before she fired, Peter's rig slid in very close to Roger's, the cab's abreast. Peter's truck knocked over several of the clutching creatures. One of the zombies that was caught directly under the front wheels was still moving and clawing at the air. Several creatures jumped at the driver's side window of Peter's cab. Roger grabbed his gun and moved to level his cab on Peter's side, but the rigs were too close and he couldn't open the door. Rolling down the window, he shouted, The windows! Open your windows! Your window! To Peter. Peter noticed that the door wouldn't open too, and he fumbled with the gear shift in order to pull away, but noticed Roger gesturing. Then he dove across the cab and rolled down the passenger's side window. Roger leaned out of his open passenger window and tried to get his weapon into a firing position. One or two zombies squeezed through the narrow space between the trucks. They were just about to reach Roger when he managed to fire. His bullet killed the lead ghoul. Other zombies moved around the front of Roger's cab, and they reached him in a moment. The steady buzz from the helicopter sounded overhead. Steve was getting more and more frustrated as he watched his companions. He wanted to land the helicopter and help, but he had given Fran his gun and was sure that if he disobeyed Peter's orders, he'd have hell to pay later on. Fran was perched on the edge of the roof, watching in desperation. She tried to aim her rifle at the creatures, but her hair kept blowing in her eyes from the pass of the chopper. She brushed it away with irritation. Roger, in front! She shouted over the engine noises. Roger, in front! Roger! She screamed, very excited and agitated. Roger fired again and again down the narrow space between the vans. Another zombie fell. The dead bodies littered the parking area like so many pieces of paper. Roger was not in direct danger anymore, but he seemed to be getting sadistic pleasure out of his target practice. For Christ's sake, come on! Peter yelled out angrily. But Roger was like a crazy man. He leaned out of his window in a very vulnerable position, whooping like a child as he tried to level off another shot. 
Suddenly, a zombie grabbed him from behind, and he almost fell out of the window. He struggled to hold himself and keep a grip on his gun. Peter leaned over and tried to get a shot at the creature, but he couldn't get a clean shot. Roger grabbed frantically at the window frame on Peter's door and tried to pull himself up. A second creature grabbed him from behind as well. Monsters. Monsters. Fran uttered emotionally. She fired her gun. The bullet slammed into the pavement, kicking up a cloud of smoke. It narrowly missed one of the creatures. She fired again, and this time, her shot tore into the shoulder of the zombie, but it didn't stop him. The chopper zoomed in very close. Dust and debris flew up in the trooper's face in its wake. Peter was still unable to get off a shot, and the added particles frustrated him. He shot a look of disgust up at Steve. Roger, using both hands, swung his gun butt in an uppercut. It slammed against one of the creatures that was grabbing him, and it drove the ghouls back with a staggering motion. Then, in a desperate heaving of strength, Roger climbed through the window into Peter's cab. Peter pulled the big rig away even while Roger's legs were still hanging out of the window, bouncing around from the movement. The zombies grabbed at Roger's ankles, and one managed to hold on as the truck picked up speed. Like a madwoman, Fran fired again and again. One shot ripped into the zombie that held onto Roger's legs. It let go and fell, rolling across the pavement. She fired again, and this bullet hit the pavement. The creature managed to struggle to its knees, raising its head and looking about wildly for its unseen opponent. Once more, Fran brought the rifle up, sighted it, and fired. This time, the shot hit the creature's neck. Once again, she fired. Now it was the zombie's shoulder. She was really cooking now. Confidently, she aimed for the head, and the bullet hit its mark. The creature sprawled on the cement. Fran leaped for joy and aimed at another creature and began to shoot. The helicopter passed overhead. Steve had watched fascinated as Fran picked off one zombie after another. The woman was really remarkable. Once she set her mind to something. Jesus! Roger suddenly exclaimed. What? Peter asked, just as his truck was about to roll out of the lot. My goddamn bag! He suddenly realized. I left my goddamn bag in the other truck! Peter brought the vehicle to a screeching halt. All right now, you son of a bitch. He fumed in anger. You better screw your fucking head on, baby. Yeah, yeah, Roger assured him. I'm okay. Let's go. Suddenly, Peter grabbed the other man by his lapels and slammed his back against the door of the cab. I mean it. Now you're not just playing with your life. You're playing with mine. The two men stared at each other for a moment. Roger was startled somewhat out of his emotional exhilaration. He stared at Peter, a confused, hurt look on his face. He thought they were buddies in combat, through thick and thin. All right, Peter softened. Now are you straight? Yeah, he sulked. Peter released him and returned to the wheel. He gunned the engine, and the monstrous rig roared into a big arcing turn in the parking lot. Through her gun sights, Fran could see the truck returning. The helicopter had already flown over the roof, and Steve was wondering why the truck hadn't appeared on the road. Fran turned and tried to signal Stephen with the tip of her rifle extended. Finally, he saw her and flew closer. The woman waved a high sign, and the chopper buzzed back over the lot. With her hair whipping around her face, Fran took up her position again, her rifle at the ready. She thought for a moment and then began to reload the weapon, pulling the shells from the breast pocket of her shirt. Peter's truck zoomed back into position, again colliding with some of the zombies in the area. As soon as the truck pulled to a stop, Roger leaped out and climbed in through the window of the other cab. He snatched up his knapsack and several tools that were strewn over the seat and floor. The wires where he had jumped the engine were all entangled in colors of blue and red and yellow. 
Bits of glass and blood had splattered the seat covers. As soon as the activity started again, more zombies were attracted to the vicinity. They converged on the cab area. Two more came up between the trucks and several came around the front of the cab. Meanwhile, Fran struggled to load the gun quickly. She had taught herself to shoot it in a matter of minutes, just applying some simple logic. Again, the helicopter buzzed overhead. As Roger climbed through the window to enter Peter's cab, his pack accidentally fell to the ground. With a reflex action, he dropped between the two cabs, landing on his feet. Panicking, he realized that he was facing the two creatures who were approaching quickly. He reached up and with one hand on each of the open window frames, swung his legs up hard. His kick sent the creatures sprawling. Then he bent to collect his pack. Once again, he was grabbed from behind. And once again, Peter tried to level off his gun but was unable to get a shot. At this point, he almost felt like shooting Roger. The guy was going off half-cocked. He wasn't all there. His actions and his decisions were not the reactions of a well-trained soldier. And if there was one thing that Peter couldn't abide, it was sloppy maneuvers. Fran tried to get a shot, but she didn't have the confidence in her accuracy with Roger in the way. Surprisingly, Roger kept his cool this time. And his first thought was for the pack of tools. He reached out and tossed the sack into the cab of Peter's truck as though he were making a hook shot with a basketball. Peter caught the pack as several of the tools clattered out and onto the floor of the cab. The creature that was holding onto Roger gained an advantage from Roger's imbalance when he threw the pack, and now it bit at the man's arm. Roger tore away as soon as he felt the bite, but blood appeared at the wound. Then Roger squared off a solid punch right to the zombie's jaw. The creature flew back and, in a domino effect, almost knocked over the others behind it. Roger jumped, making a grab for the window of Peter's cab. Meanwhile, the zombies that Roger had pushed over had struggled to their feet and were regrouping. They advanced and grabbed at the squirming trooper. He tried to get a hold on the side of the door by pushing with the soles of his feet, but he couldn't get a hold on the slippery surface. Peter dropped his rifle and moved to help Roger by grabbing his hand, but Roger fell from the high window back to the pavement. Peter drew his handgun, sitting up in the seat to see where Roger had fallen. Once again, Roger leaped, his hands catching the window frame. The zombies clutched at him viciously. He swung up his legs and kicked the creatures off balance. This time he managed to get his feet locked against the door, and Peter grabbed the trooper's arm with his free hand. But another zombie was pulling at his shirt, and still another made a grab for his legs. Peter took careful, deliberate aim with his pistol and fired point-blank at one of the clawing ghouls. The impact caused it to fly back, and it freed Roger so that he was able to pull himself higher. His face was straining from the agony of exertion. Just as his torso was through the window, another creature grabbed him. Peter could no longer get a shot as Roger filled the window. So the big trooper dropped his pistol and pulled Roger's arms, struggling to haul him through the opening. For the second time that day, Roger dangled from the window, his legs kicking. Peter started the truck, and as it began to roll away, one of the clutching zombies was able to get a solid hold on Roger's leg. The creature opened its cavernous mouth and bit into the calf. Blood gushed out through the material, and the creature bit again, relishing the flavor and coming away with bits of flesh tangled in a blood-stained strip of material from Roger's trouser leg. A shriek of incredible agony came from Roger, and he whipped his legs around violently. The truck accelerated with a lurch and sped away, the final zombie thrown to the ground from the momentum. The creature rolled a little way on the pavement before stopping. Then it sat on the ground, hunched over like a gorilla, the bloody mass of flesh and material still dangling from its mouth. It tried to separate the cloth from the more appetizing morsels. A bullet whizzed by, disturbing the thing's tasty treat. But it continued chomping on its morsels. Another bullet tore through its shoulder, but it was still only concerned with its prize. 
The bullets were coming from Fran's rifle, and as she fired, she swore through her teeth. The gun roared, and clouds of dust flew up around her. Finally, she hit the seated creature cleanly through the head with a third bullet. She could see it fall, unnoticed by the others that walked by it. Up in the sky, the helicopter escorted the big truck back to the warehouse for the third time. The truck rumbled along, jostling the two passengers as Roger struggled to tie a tourniquet around his bleeding leg. He used his belt and pulled it tightly. That's it, Peter stated as he heard Roger suck air in through his teeth in agony. Bullshit, Roger said, teeth clenched in pain. We gotta deal with that leg. I'm dealing with it. I'm dealing with it fine. I won't be able to walk on this at all if we wait. Can you walk on it now? Peter shot back, anger rising in him at Roger's stubbornness. You're damn right I can. Damn right I can. He shot back just as arrogantly. He struggled to wrap the bloody part of his leg with a torn piece of trouser. I stopped moving this leg, Roger said sharply, with great deep breaths between his words. He could hardly keep from screaming out. The pain was so intense and the gash so deep. May not ever get it going again. There's a lot to get done before, before you can afford to lose me. Peter turned and stared at his friend for a second, not believing that Roger could think him so callous. But then he guessed he never really told Roger about his feelings one way or the other. Dismissing it as an emotional outburst, he drove on to the warehouse, escorted by Steve's chopper.